for uh, coming out. Welcome uh, to this uh, public uh, witness hearing on American Indian Alaska Native programs under the jurisdiction of the Interior Environment Appropriation Subcommittee. I especially want to welcome the distinguished tribal elders and leaders testifying today and in the audience. Most of you have traveled a long way to be here this week. I hope you'll seize the opportunity to meet with other members of Congress outside the subcommittee to remind them uh, that honoring the nation's trust obligations is a responsibility shared by all members of Congress, regardless of our state or congressional district. I can assure you that your voices are heard by this subcommittee, but we need your help to continue to build awareness and support among our colleagues here in Congress. For those uh, new to this process, today's hearing are just the start of a dialogue we've come to depend upon to help us make smart choices in the budget and learn the, uh, the, earn the votes of our colleagues. Be assured that the American Indian and Alaska Native programs will continue to be a nonpartisan priority for this subcommittee, just as they've been in recent years under the chairmanships of Democrats and Republicans alike. Before we begin, I have a bit of housekeeping items to share. Committee rules prohibit the use of outside cameras and audio equipment during these hearings. The hearings can be viewed in its entirety on the committee's website and on an official hearing transcript, which will be available at gpo.gov. I, uh, I will call each panel of witnesses to the table, one panel at a time. Each witness will have five minutes to present testimony. Their full testimony will be included in the record. So please don't feel pressured to cover everything in five minutes. Finishing in less than five minutes may even earn you a couple of brownie points, so <laughs> keep, that, keep that in mind. We'll be using a timer to track the progress of each witness. When the light turns yellow, uh, the witness will have one minute remaining to conclude his or her remarks. When the light blinks red, I will have to ask you to uh, stop. We'll hear from every witness on each panel before members will be provided an opportunity to ask questions. Before we have, uh, because we have a full day ahead, I request that we try to keep things moving in order to stay on schedule and respect each other's time. I'm sure we all have planes to catch. With that, I thank you all again for being here today, and I'm happy to yield now to my distinguished colleague from the state of Washington, Derek Kilmer, for any opening remarks. Thank, thanks, Chairman. I know our ranking member will be here uh, later as well, and um, I just want to uh, uh, reiterate the gratitude that the Chairman raised to all of the tribal leaders and elders who are here. Um, Mr. Chairman, you're right that uh, uh, they did come from far away. I think um, uh, it's hard to think of someplace far away, uh, more far away than uh, than some of the uh, tribes represented here this morning. So. Um, I, I really am grateful for folks taking the time to come to our nation's capital and make sure your story is told. So th thank you, Chairman. Thank you. So we're going to start. First uh, is Fawn Sharp, President of the Klonot uh, Indian Nation. Welcome. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman uh, and our Congressman. I want to, first of all, just uh, express my gratitude as well for uh, your leadership and the committee's leadership. You know, this has not been an easy year for Indian country and our federal trust relationship. Uh, and oftentimes at home, we are faced with uh, a great deal of fear about uh, what's going to happen with our tribal nations and the funding. Uh, many of our citizens were keenly aware that there was uh, an effort to reduce BIA funding by 30% and or 25% and uh, HHS funding by 25%. And each time I had an opportunity to talk to our citizens uh, and address that very direct fear, I was able to uh, see the faces of this committee. And I actually mentioned uh, some of you by name, uh, Congressman Cole and Calvert, others that, uh, Congressman Kilmer, that have our backs that while there's a great deal of fear and uncertainty in Indian country during this time, that we have many friends in Congress who understand that there is a trust and treaty obligation to tribal nations and that they will fight for us inside Congress. So thank you for that leadership and thank you for those words. I, I wanna begin by talking about uh, the trust responsibility. Uh, last year I mentioned during my testimony that the Quinault Nation has undertaken some budget analysis to determine to what extent are we subsidizing the federal trust responsibility. Uh, we put that number at about $6 million annually. 
where the Quinault Nation is providing additional funding to close the gap between those things that are required either by statute or other uh, federal requirement uh, to be fulfilled at the Quinault Nation and we are subsidizing those functions. Uh, very specifically, the first item I wanna mention is our forestry program. Under the uh, National Indian Forestry Management Act, we are required to adopt a 10-year forest management plan. We did that this last year and I asked our staff when we pass a resolution implementing the new uh, FMP, I wanna know to what extent are we subsidizing the federal trust responsibility and to what extent are we required to do things under F, uh, the FMP for which we don't receive funding. That number is uh, $1,065,000. So over a million dollars annually, we are required to uh, pay four dollars for which we do not receive to actually implement the uh, forest management plan. So that one uh, issue alone, we're subsidizing um, $10 million over the period of that 10 year forest management plan. So it's, it's abundantly clear to us that we need to figure out a way to close that gap because there's a current state in Indian country. I believe many tribes are facing a, a quiet crisis if not a humanitarian crisis. And we have a very clear vision on how we wanna close that gap. And this next year, uh, we will be presenting to Congress a suite of recommendations on how to close that gap because we know that we cannot continue at this pace. We know that you're doing everything you can to try to improve and increase funding, but the dollars simply aren't there. And we have ways and ideas on how to close that gap to improve the economic conditions of our tribal nations. And I look forward to having that conversation with you. Uh, the second point I'd like to raise is village relocation. I've mentioned this uh, in a number of my testimonies throughout the years. We are facing sea level rise at the Quinault Nation and we just finished a master plan. We're looking forward to continuing to work with our federal partners to secure the $65 million necessary uh, to move our entire village to higher ground. It's now under sea level and each time we have a high sea level uh, event or a storm, we face uh, a crisis where we may have to evacuate an entire village. So we're gonna continue to work on that issue. I wanna thank the committee for its advocacy in, in, in ensuring that the HIP program remains. Uh, we're well aware that there was an effort to zero out HIP funding and this is uh, a source of funding that is absolutely necessary for some of our most vulnerable citizens and, and we appreciate your advocacy in, in that area. I'd also like to mention that uh, we are continuing to advocate for a renewed partnership with the federal government. Uh, the BIA is currently undertaking a reorganization effort. Uh, the Quinault Nation is taking a very active and engaged role in uh, explaining from our perspective how many of the recommendations that are being advanced by the administration in terms of reorganization just simply are not in Indian country's best interests. And so we are not only going to be engaging with Interior on identifying the weaknesses with our complaints, we're also coming to the table with some solutions. And so we're looking forward to working with the administration and not only identifying the challenges and the problems that they're facing, but also coming to the table with solutions. And we thank you for your partnership and leadership uh, as we continue to advance our, our issues and priorities. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, right on time. Yes. Perfect. <laughs> I'm sharp. Sure. <laughs> yeah. Next uh, is uh, Francis Charles, chairwoman of the Lower Eloa Kalam tribe. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, um, committee members, for giving me the opportunity to identify some of our priorities. We have several priorities, but I know we're limited with time. I really want to hit on some of the issues of the dam removal projects that we had. Um, incurred and, and been very honored to have the removal of these two dams with because of the historical ties of our fisheries and the concerns that our community still has. There has been some unmet needs that have been identified in the 1992 act of the $4 million that was uh, passed by congressional level as well as some of the um, fee to our, our the land acquisition itself. Originally, there was 4,000 acres that was supposed to have been titled to the Kalalam people, uh, the strong people, but we 
been basically uh, av available to purchase some outstanding acres from our neighbors and whatnot from originally 356 acres to 1,000 acres now. So we're looking for some continuing support to acquire the land and um, looking for the $4 million for housing as well as some of the land acquisition. Our concerns entail to what you're going to be hearing today for the budget cuts that are increasing and have an impact on all of the Indian tribes as well as ourselves for the land, not, not only for the salmon hatcheries in our rivers. Uh, we've had to build a state-of-the-art um, hatchery to uh, subside for the requirements of the agencies for the dam removal projects that we incurred. So we're asking for some additional funding for the operation and management aspects of it as well. Indian child welfare has been a major play um, in our, our governmental areas and it's been challenging for our programs because our increases of 65% now for the for the lack of the funding that we have in our communities has a heavily impact on foster care parents. We're really lacking the subsidies of what's needed for not only for our tribal courts because it has a ripple effect to our community with our law enforcement, with our social services program and the TANA program, general assistance is one of those that are shortfalled as well, but we're concerned for the impacts that it has on our grandparents because they're the ones that are taken in consideration in raising their grandchildren. We're concerned with a lack of funding that is entitled to our court systems. We've been fortunate enough to build a court system within our own jurisdiction to take over some of the cases within our community and been fortunate enough uh, to have a, a full-time judge now that is working with our enforcement aspects of it. But what is alarming is the crime rates and the jurisdictional matters that are still taking place in our community. You know, we recently had a rape case that is on reservation and um, working partners with the uh, Kalalam County Sheriff's Department and other jurisdictional matters that were um, hampered with on these cases that uh, impact the families and in our communities. We're working generously with the other agencies on trying to uh, fulfill some of the responsibilities and the education and the fisheries and, and uh, um, some of the, the challenges that we have and the shortfalls that we're <coughs> subsidizing in our education uh, aspects of it, the housing areas of it that is being looked at and being um, criticized for taking out those resources. Uh, Fawn Sharp had indicated the HIP programs. Those are some of the programs that are definitely needed within our communities just as much so we're asking for the continuing support of the presidential's budget to oppose some of the the budget aspects of it of what he's looking at because it, it really has an impact on not only us but everybody. The clinical parts of it, we're, we're struggling at this point in time. Um, we're subsidizing with the third-party bill-in aspects of it. We subsidize with some of our gaming revenue to keep uh, afloat of what's taking place in our communities because not only are we servicing Clallam County area, but Jefferson County just as much. We're not only a tribal, we see other natives in our uh, community, but also the surrounding communities as well. So we're asking you to continue supporting some of the tribal needs and references to the inquire some of the, the Medicare, Medicaid parts of it because it really has an impact if those programs are cut out of there for the tribes. It, it's something that has been negotiated through the process and we're asking you to continue on with the support for the Medicare, Medicaid and our elders and, and the, the needs that is necessary for them. I know that uh, you, you'll be hearing a lot of the issues that are taking place from national, the Native uh, Indian Health Board, the National Congress of American Indians, the Northwest Indian Fisheries, and other agencies, and we continue to support them. We have their back just as much as you do. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next is Abigail Echo Hawk, Director of the Urban Indian in uh, Health Institute. Good morning, and I would like to echo the thanks of being able to come here and share this. Thank you so much, Chairman Culvert and the members of the committee. We are so thankful for the opportunity to share with you the needs and the resiliencies that exist within our communities, both in urban and rural settings. Um, I'm, I'm Abigail Echohawk, the director of the Urban Indian Health in Institute. Uh, we are one of 12 tribal epidemiological centers that are located across the United States. Our core funding com comes from the Indian Health Service. Our mission is to represent the data, the research, and the information that is needed in order to make informed 
policy and program decisions for our tribal communities, both in urban and rural settings. The in Urban Indian Health Institute is unique, as in we are the only one that looks at the urban Indian population across the United States. According to the U.S. Census, approximately 70% of American Indians and Alaska Natives currently live in urban settings, and many, like myself, migrate in between our tribal settings and back into the cities for a multitude of different opportunities. However, we know that when we look at large data sets, very often it is impossible to find statistically significant information on American Indian Alaska Native people. The role that the texts provide is to ensure that that data is there and that it's gathered in a way that recognizes that gathering information, doing evaluation, and conducting research is an indigenous value for indigenous people by indigenous people. The only opportunity where that is happening right now is within the tribal epidemiological centers. And so right now, currently, we uh, have about $4.2 million that is distributed across the tribal epi centers. It is near, nowhere near the funds we need in order to have the impact and to be able to serve our communities in the way that we would like. Nothing to me is more illustrative of this than the current epidemic that we see of missing and murdered indigenous women across the United States. Currently, we have tribal communities who are advocating for better data, for better work within their, uh, with both county, state, and federal departments to get these numbers. Uh, the Urban Indian Health Institute is currently working with a PhD student, a PhD student who maintains the only database on missing and murdered indigenous women in the United States, a PhD student. I have no funding to support her. My, well, how I support her and pay her for this work is minimal speaking fees of when I go out and do talks. Um, and so when I look at that and I look at what's happening in that, we're working in 66 cities across the United States gathering data. I see things such as the information that they're giving me isn't correct. They're not matching the correct names. They didn't collect race and ethnicity. I have half the cities that I'm working with who simply didn't respond to a public records request. The work that we're doing is incredibly important. In order for all of you to make the programming decisions, the policy decisions, the data that we are creating at the tribal epicenters is necessary. However, with this minimal funding of $4.2 million, we are not able to provide everything that we should be able to. At the very minimal, we need $24 million spread across the tribal epicenters through the Indian Health Service in order to provide the information that is needed. We do know also that when you receive data, it often has not been analyzed from a strength-based perspective. Very often people are coming into tribal communities and want to point out all of the problems. We have the answers to the problems within our communities, and when that data is done with an indigenous sovereignty pers data perspective, we are able to bring that to you where you can see where we build upon the strengths, and instead of looking at the deficits, we recognize, for example, American Indian Alaska Native people currently have the highest rates of sobriety of any racial or ethnic group across the United States. That is totally against the popular narrative that talks about problematic drinking in our communities. We do have a problem with binge drinking. That allows us to take a look at the information and really focus our efforts on where we're doing really well and where we can also help other communities learn and grow from what we have done. The Special Diabetes Program for Indians, and thank you so much again for um, approving that because we have seen incredible strides. We have seen more than a 50% decrease in end-stage renal failure across urban American Indians and rural American Indian Alaska Native people, which it translates into cost savings because the CMS uh, pays for um, end-stage renal disease, which is often done in dialysis centers. So we have seen an incredible effort happening, and the data needs to be done from an indigenous perspective. I'm just touching really briefly on research. Our communities are in need of research that is, again, done for Native people by Native people. Research dollars do not reach our communities, and we are working actively to bring those dollars to our communities so that we can address our problems and our solutions from our own perspective. Um, I had a community, I was doing a survey, and I met a woman who told me the story of her, her grandmother, and her daughter all had breast cancer at the exact same time. They were in a high quality research center receiving care, and not one time were they asked to engage in a research study. So we need to include our people. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, next, uh, Ray Peters, uh, Intergovernmental Affairs, uh, the Saskatchewan Indian Tribe? Squaxin Island Tribe. Okay. You were close. Welcome. Kinda. <laughs> On behalf of the Squaxin Island uh, Tribal Leadership and the Citizens, it's my honor to provide funding uh, for the FY uh, 2019 uh, budget. 
We request that travel program funding throughout the federal government be exempt from future sequestration and, and recessions uh, and cuts. Uh, we express, express gratitude on fully funding the uh, contract support costs. We fully support uh, the regional request of Northwest, uh, 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 the regional request affiliated tribes of Northwest Indians, uh, Portland uh, Area Indian Health Board, and uh, Northwest Indian Fish Commission. Uh, Squaxin Island also supports the national budget request from the National Congress of American Indians. Um, I wanted to touch base on our facility that we r run, Northwest Indian Treatment Center, with the epidemic across the nation, uh, with the opioid and the heroin. Uh, we are asking that any dollars that are provided, uh, that tribes get that set aside money, uh, that we can get it directly uh, instead of having it go to the states. Uh, the treatment center uh, provides treatment throughout Oregon, Washington, Idaho, uh, and we have not had any increase in our uh, funding since our initial base funding provided by the congressional uh, set aside in 1993. We'd ask that uh, that budget increase uh, at least $3 million. Uh, as well, you're aware of the uh, shellfish settlement we are also requesting uh, management dollars. Uh, we have about 80 to 90 percent of state and treaty lands that are we are unable to sustain our shellfish uh, management, uh, as well as our right to be able to go and exercise our treaty right on private lands to be able to go out and do surveys. Uh, when the shellfish agreement was uh, settled, we decided, uh, the federal government and the tribes, that we would set aside the management dollars that we needed to manage our, our programs. We inhabit the seven inlets of the Lower Puget Sound, which is very rich in shellfish. And we also, with the climate change and the ocean acidification, there is a need to be able to provide uh, seed to the tribes of the Lower Puget Sound, as well as the uh, also the um, companies, uh, because of the climate uh, and ocean acidification, we're requesting $2.5 million for a nursery, which will allow us to go ahead and boost the seed uh, because of uh, the ocean acidification. The shellfish uh, cannot adequately survive and so it allows us to boost the seed to be able to then plant it on uh, the uh, beaches. Uh, because of our reservation uh, and it is free of growth or construction, uh, it is a very uh, unique place that would provide uh, a benefit to such a nursery um, and so it would be an ideal uh, place. Um, national uh, requests and recommendations. We ask that the special diabe diabetes program, we oppose moving uh, these into uh, discretionary spending for mandatory spending. That will mean SBDPI will compete for other Indian program funding annually as opposed to being funded automatically. We need to have tribal consultation. Uh, again, $150 million for the opioid funding. Uh, as well, Squaxin Island Tribe, we rely on contract health support uh, in purchased and referred care. Um, our clinic doesn't isn't able to provide uh, emergent uh, needs or spe sp special needs. And so to be able to have that uh, contract health, to be able to refer patients out is critical for our health of our, of our uh, tribal community. Thank you for accepting the 2019 budget requests and recommendations. Thank you and uh, certainly thank this panel. Any, uh, any questions for this panel? 
Gotcha. Thanks, Chairman. Um, and I want to say thanks again to each of you for coming. Um, Chairwoman Charles, uh, I, I, and I want to say this publicly, I want to thank the Chairman. And in the last uh, appropriations bill, there was report language directing the Department of Interior to work with the tribe on the land transfer issue. I think the question I want to ask for you is, <laughs> is the Department of Interior working with the tribe on the land transfer issue? And do you have any guidance for us as we approach this next round of approves? Thank you for asking that. Um, no. <laughs> uh, it, it's it's been really frustrating for us because right now we don't know what the status is of it is with the changes that are occurring back here in regards to any communications that we're having uh, with the park or with any of the other agencies that are involved. We have had sent some notifications and letters out asking what the status is, um, but to this day we haven't gotten any responses to that. Thanks. Let me tell you first, thank you for your being here, and I think you've done an excellent job representing your communities. Uh, Ms. Echohawk, you said something I was interested in, and um, you talked about this PhD student who's trying to gather information on the missing and, and murdered women. Um, is that the right? Yes. Um, tell me, are you trying to collect information outside of the tribal communities as well? Like for example, if someone's living in Salt Lake City, where I'm from, uh, her family, maybe she grew up there and, and hasn't really associated with the community. That's much harder to do. Are they? Are you trying to reach into you know to across the board, or are you concentrating primarily in the tribal communities in that research? So um, the work that uh, her name is Anita is doing is looking at any cases that have happened anywhere across the United States. My project is actually very specific to non-tribal lands. The tribal communities are doing an incredible job of advocating and working within their tribal sovereignty to get access to the information. The urban settings, and Salt Lake City is actually one of the areas that we're looking into right now, is one of the problems. And what I've found, again, is that people are not collecting race and ethnicity within um, these cases or they're simply not responding to our public records requests. So we anticipate releasing a report in about six months that is going to detail the 66 cities, including Salt Lake City, uh, looking at this <laughs> issue and the problems that exist in order for us to actually get this information and to be able to match the names and really recognize and honor the families of these missing and murdered indigenous women. And so like in the course of a just natural police report or police uh, work, they wouldn't necessarily identify someone as being a tribal member. Is that true? Yes, and so some of the problems <coughs> that exist is that... Let me understand. When you say yes, yes, what I said was true, or yes, they would. Yes, what you said is true. Currently, right now, it's very, you know, they may just look at an individual and decide what race and ethnicity they are, um, and very often, particularly those who are murdered, uh, often that identification is done within the actual funeral home. So a funeral director will make the decision versus talking to a family. There was a recent study that showed for American Indian, Alaska Native people, we currently have more than a 30% misidentification of our racial and tribal identities at the time of death. And so it is an extreme problem that um, my organization and the other tribal epicenters are currently working on. Okay. All right, well thank you and you know, bless you in that work. It's an important effort, obviously. Thank you. Uh, thank you, and um, regarding the opioid uh, funding, I think that all of us are interested in making sure we track that properly, so if you can continue to communicate with the committee and, and everyone else, uh, because I suspect we're going to invest a significant amount of money into that. We'd like to see what kind of results uh, are being made. So thank you for your attending. We appreciate it. You're excused. Um, our next uh, group that comes on up. I think there's a. Okay. I don't know if there's going to be. Uh, he had a son, W. Allen Jr. I don't know. <laughs> Good sign. <That's> it. Yeah. <laughs> well, welcome. We appreciate you coming out. Uh, let's start with uh, Ron Allen, tribal chairman and CEO of the Jamestown Escalam tribe. Yep. Welcome. Yep. Escalam. You know, we, we 
in the Northwest, you, we have a lot of S tribes and, and uh, we're all tongue twisters. Um, well, Mr. Chairman uh, and members of the committee, I um, thank you again uh, uh, to be uh, honored to be able to testify about uh, many issues that, are, that affect my tribe and Indian country. Um, I'm a very active tribal leader. I have been for quite a few years now, and uh, so um, I've made the request for a couple of presentations. So my intent is, is to touch on three main issues, tribal specific with regard, with regard to my tribe. Uh, I, I am a co-chair of the BIA uh, uh, Tribal Interior uh, Budget Advisory Committee, and I'm also a commissioner on the, in, on the U.S. Canada Pacific Salmon Commission, so I'm going to squeeze uh, uh, a request in on, on that particular subject matter as well. I do want to say to you in the committee um, uh, that we are very appreciative of what you did for FY18. Um, um, the increases uh, categorically across the board um, made a big difference and, and uh, brought a lot of smiles across the Indian country, uh, and so we were, we were very appreciative of it. Uh, um, I'll touch a little bit on, on the administration's recommendations for this year and, la and next year, et cetera, which are extremely disappointing for us. But, but that, that, is a, that is a huge um, uh, appreciation for our goals with regard to self-determination, self-governance, and, and uh, the advancement of tribes becoming, uh, uh, once again, independent nations. So, um, uh, and you know, I, I guess a backdrop, you know, you guys have a hard uh, challenge uh, when you think about all the many issues that you have on your plate and, and when you think about Indian country and, and the federal government provides probably around 20 billion or so across all federal programs that serve Indian country, and the need of Indian country probably is north of 200 billion. So you're never gonna quite get there by the federal government resources. So it is really incumbent on the, the administration and the, the Congress to um, help advance the tribe's ability to become self-reliant so that our own resources can fill that gap. That's how you have filled the real needs of, of our respective Indian communities from Alaska to Florida. So uh, it's, it's a huge challenge for us. And, and you're going to hear um, over the course of the next two days a, a couple of big issues that, that, that are crisscrossing Indian country. And one of them is the, you know, the, what's happening over in HHS um, with regard to the determination of uh, the status of Indians. You know, we have 200 plus years of, of recognition of the tribes as a political entity. All of a sudden now they want to make us race-based. And I know that many of you are well aware of it. Um, it's, a, it's a very um, um, con deeply concerning issue that you're going to hear um, um, on, on issues that are in HHS and IHS, but they're gonna over the, the potential of overspilling into other areas is, is going to be uh, very important to, uh, for the Congress to assist any country in addressing. So, um, but, you know, the, for my tribe, um, very quickly, um, we're very proud of we're a small tribe in, uh, up in western Washington, west of Seattle. Um, in Derrick's district, um, and uh, so we, uh, we're very proud of being very independent. You know, we, we started uh, with zero land base back in 1981, and currently we are about 1,400 acres of, of uh, trust reservation land on our own resources. We didn't ask for any money. Uh, we did years ago when we first started, and we gave up, quite frankly. We said, we're going to do it ourselves, and, and, uh, and we have and worked with the administration to uh, convert it over into reservation and trust status. Um, and uh, we really work very hard at pursuing uh, 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 that our own independence with regard to the resources needed for our community. We have uh, two specific areas that we're asking for assistance, and, and they're EPA-related issues, the, the GAP program, which we are very active in our area with respect to um, um, the, uh, econ the environmental protective measures. We spend a lot of time in our area dealing with uh, environmental protective measures, working with the communities, work at, uh, both local government and, and private sector um, to try to improve the, the status. One of our projects, for one of our economic projects, for example, is because we're, we're salmon, shellfish people, um, our, our shellfish farm is a, is a huge deal for us, and, and that, that requires a lot of, of, uh, ec a lot of environmental uh, resources in order to advance that agenda. So the, the, the two areas with regard to EPA um, are, are targeted specifically at that. Uh, that's one of many programs. We work really hard diversifying our economic portfolio in order to become um, more self-reliant. Um, I, I will say that um, we, um, we, we share um, the, uh, the, the views of our colleagues that, that support the NCI, NIHB, and, and, our, and our regional recommendations. There's a number of them that they make to you with regard to the different uh, programs in BIA, IHS, et cetera. 
and uh, and we're very supportive of that. Um, I may well uh, um, uh, underscore some of Ed's uh, comments with regard to the Northwest Indian Fish Commission because uh, we, we count on them to uh, help us with regard to protecting and advancing the, the salmon um, in interest that we have in the Northwest. It's a, for many who don't know, salmon is a, is a precious resource in the Northwest. It's a, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar industry from Alaska to the, to the, the Northwest, uh, Washington, Oregon, Idaho, and uh, we work very hard at protecting that environment. So um, one of the issues that I'm, I'm advocating for, because uh, as, as a commissioner representing 24 tri 25 tribes, one in Alaska, um, with regard to U.S.-Canada Pacific Salmon Treaty, the issue there is we spent two years negotiating the treaty to, to renegotiate it for a 10-year uh, new annex. And, and that requires a lot of resources from Commerce, from State Department, and Interior. And in Interior, there's a specific line item um, that, that deals with uh, that responsibility. So that is a huge issue for us, and so we're looking for assistance. We are, we are currently at uh, about 4.2 uh, million, I think, and it serves the 25 tribes, and we're looking to get it bumped up to the 5.2. We spend a great deal of energy in making sure that it works well with the states of, of, of Alaska, Oregon, and uh, Washington, and Idaho, and, um, and we're key to, to preserving those treaty rights. I just wanted to point out, you're in your second five-minute okay. allocation, so okay. I just wanted to let you know. So I, I, I went for three, but I, I'll, I'll settle with okay. two, you know. <laughs> so, uh, okay, so shifting quickly to the, the uh, BIA TBIC uh, process. Um, uh, you know, I'm a co-chair, and we work very hard on it. It's been uh, in a forum where the, the 12 regions, with regard to the 573 tribes, bring in our recommendations and our priorities. One thing that we will underscore with you is uh, that uh, we try to we try to prioritize the top, you know, t you know, 10 to 20 tr uh, uh, areas, um, knowing that in the 125 or so line items that it permeates all through Indian country with regard to the needs of Navajo is different than Alaska and Alaska is different than Oklahoma, et cetera. So um, it's, it's tough finding the, the, um, the balance, but we are disturbed that uh, even in the top 10, three of the top 10 were proposed to be eliminated by the administration. They're proposing for 19 uh, a dramatic uh, decrease, and, and we've had um, a significant uh, diminishment of um, – the, um, the overall resource base, you know, based on their recommendations. So we always are very appreciative of this committee s hearing and, and being sensitive to the tribe's uh, priorities and interests. Um, so I, just as an example, my rights protection I, I pointed out, it deals with fisheries and natural resources, is way down. It, it, uh, when you, when you uh, compare all the, all the balance of issues um, in Indian country, you know, it's a Northwest-centric agenda, and somewhat in, in the Great Lakes as well. But it will never get up in the top 20. So, but the administration, uh, we, we advocate for this committee and, and the administration to be sensitive to that. Those are treaty rights. Those are trust treaty rights, and, and, and it cuts across a, a lot of different areas. It's an important process. It's a complicated process because of, of the diversity of needs with regard to the different tribes from the East Coast to the West Coast. And, uh, and so we, we have made our recommendations to, to, this, to this committee, um, and we emphasize for it the economic development is a big deal, a loan, the, the loan guarantee program, the, the, the infrastructure needs with regard to uh, roads improvement programs, et cetera. Those things are all relative to economic development, aside from the social programs that are so important to help deal with it. You know, you talked about opiates a, a few moments ago. Well, it's not just the opiates. There's other issues. There's other substance abuse, behavioral issues, mental health issues, and so forth that are all relevant, relevant to employment. They're relevant to uh, dysfunctional family issues that we, have, we try to wrestle with. They're relevant to the education program, with the BIE programs. We have, a, we have a, I can't remember, 120 Indian schools out there that, that need their standards need to be raised, et cetera. So um, it, 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 we work really hard at trying to get a strong message to you with regard to um, – the, the needs of Indian country um, and be respectful of all of our needs um, and then while we try to champion things that are to tribal specific issues. So I, I uh, appreciate the opportunity to be here. Um, there's lots of issues that, that we want to raise with you um, and uh, so sometimes we get disappointed like, like the tax reform initiative that you just passed. We didn't get the, the Indian parity issue wasn't in there. So we're disappointed but we're not discouraged. Okay, so, so we will keep coming back at you in order for us to, to get to the 200 billion plus, it's about the America 
being respectful of our of our unique nation status and our ability to be able to take care of our own needs and, and help our, our legal and political status. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Um, you made the point the administration uh, is making recommendations that uh, we don't agree with. Well, sometimes we don't agree with them either, and so uh, we'll, we'll proceed as the uh, legislative body and, and make determinations as we move this process forward. So I, I don't think uh, we'll seem disappointed in the, in the final outcome. What's that? Uh, next, uh, Mr. Uh, Johnstone, you're recognized. How's that? Thank, thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's truly an honor to uh, sit here before you today and be with my relatives throughout Indian country. My relative to my left, William Ron Allen, Jamestown Sklallam, is where my grandfather was born in 1877, Sklallam Indian. So that's that's the flavor you get here with us from the Northwest. Very honored to be with Congressman Kilmer from the 6th, my congressman. Carries on a rich tradition of Congress that has supported us in our treaty rights through time. A storied past in those treaty rights through um, the history of how we've evolved in this process uh, having the United States protect our treaty rights that we signed those treaty treaties with in the mid-1850s that are basically the lifeblood of who we are still existing here that many years later. Uh, Ron po points out the importance to salmon to us in Indian country, in western Washington in particular. And um, so as the story goes, the the way that we're brought up is I have to introduce myself and part of that was talking about my grandfather, Frank Law, um, and my mother, Marge Johnstone, and my grandmother uh, was born in Ho River in 1898. And we come to the Quinault people and my name is Ed Johnstone. I'm the treasurer of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. I'm a Quinault tribal member, commissioner from Quinault to the Fish Commission. The Fish Commission's 20 member tribes formed shortly after the Bolt decision, 1974, 1975. And the leaders of the time look, looked at what was needed in that decision and the judge was very specific what the requirements were to uphold your treaty rights and to be co-managers of this resource. So we manage these fisheries from the white caps, the snow caps of the Cascade Mountains through Puget Sound, the Straits of Juan de Fuca to 200 miles out in the Pacific Ocean from Canada to Mexico because we're brought into those processes like Ron is talking about, the Pacific Salmon Treaty, Pacific Fisheries Management Council, International Pacific Halibut, all these things that we must do, they're not optional. So I thank Ron for that, those reminders and thank you for the support. The words are very powerful of, of the chairman when he started this session about the recognition of the importance of the work that we do, not only we do, but as Congress does, and the support has been, has not gone unnoticed. We appreciate in these very tough times in the atmosphere of the budgets and realignment and different um, issues concerned with how the United States spends its money and some of these um, reductions that have been mentioned earlier have been very concerning to us, but we've done very well with this committee's support and we appreciate that, that we can continue to do the work together, the United States, through Congress, through appropriations, and us, us tribes, us organizations like the Northwest Indian Fish Commission, Columbia River, Indian Fish Commission, Great Lakes, and others under those treaty organizations that Ron mentioned, rights protection, so important to us. That's the backbone 
of our ability to be co-managers to uphold those responsibilities. Uh, and we appreciate the support over time that we've had from this committee. And we have a, we have a, a rich history with, you know, our, our, our former congressman and our, our former chair, Congressman Norm Dix, and those that have supported us over time for these good causes. You know, I have uh, submitted my, um, the written, written testimony. I'd just like to tr maybe touch on just a few of the um, important uh, recognitions. Number one was uh, Tribal Management and Development, TMDL, where we were having issues with our SHIAP program. And uh, that SHIAP program um, was very critical to the tribes and, and it was uh, at risk of being, uh, I guess, say, penciled out. And um, a lot of good work was done um, from our perspective, from our staffs and, and from Interior, BIA, and from some of the staff at some of the, uh, maybe at uh, a congressional level to straighten that out. And that was a commitment that goes way back into the 90s. And we've secured that. And that, that program is so important to all of us. We actually produce a document that is the state of the watershed. And that's the go-to document by the state of Washington, the federal government, and others that, that has a full characterization of every watershed of all those 20 treaty tribes. And so that means entirely in, in, in Puget Sound, the Straits of Juan de Fuca, and to the Washington coast, to mid-coast. Every bit of it is characterized in that valuable report. So those are the, those are the um, you know, the, the benefits of, of having strong support here and, and in the work that we do to ensure that those things happen. Uh, fish, wildlife, and parks, there's some, some uh, in particular, there's some um, places in that that we would have you, you know, be aware of and look at. Puget Sound Geographic Program, very critical to that work that Ron is talking about. It goes hand in glove with the work that we all do. And, and uh, you know, if you look at it, um, President Sharp's conclusions, she has a, a little message in there that says that, that um, we can't do it alone. And, and um, that's exactly what we say at the Northwest Union Fish Commission is we, we can't do it alone. And the terminology is to ensure and assist that our member, our member tribes build a brighter future for our member tribes and their people. And we echo that, and, and that really is the basis of what we do. Thank you. Thank you very much. We appreciate your testimony, and uh, we certainly have a mutual interest in your prosperity and the health of, of your nation, and uh, we'll continue to work with you to make sure that it's good. Thank Any uh, questions for the uh, witnesses? Thank you, Chairman. Um, I first want to express gratitude to Ed for uh, representing the Northwest Indian Fisheries Commission. He comes in a uh, amazing tradition of Billy Frank Jr. in uh, telling the story and articulating the priorities of the commission, and I, I thank you for that. Um, I also want to thank Chairman Allen and was hoping quickly if you could just talk about your experience with the fee to trust process at BIA. Um, if you can give us a sense on, our, on average, how long does it take to get land into trust? How's that process been? Well, it, uh, it was going fairly well. I um, uh, um, don't want to get into politics. You know, the, the last administration, we were getting, we were, we all of Indian country was doing much, much better. It slowed down. Um, and um, right now we're, we're getting clarification that, um, that the lands within the reservation or adjacent to reservation and trust lands can stay in the regional area, which helps the process, makes it reasonably timely. Um, there's lots of steps that, that, are th that you have to go through. If it's not adjacent, um, then it, it, it comes back to Washington, D.C., and what we say goes up to sixth floor, which is the secretary floor, um, and it slows way down. And so the process is, is much slower. It's not problematic. It's, uh, uh, the only issues often are gaming, and, and gaming has a very rigid process and, and a very high level to get over. Um, but they get confused, uh, I think, um, over 
when we make it real clear, there's no gaming going on on this trust land it's for other purposes. So uh, it's just uh, um, it, the, the pro that's where the problem emerges is where they, 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 they ask the question and don't seem to get the, don't seem to agree when we say no gaming, okay, therefore just get it off your plate and move it. But um, it's one desk that it goes through. And so it's not, it's not good for lands that we're putting into, pr into, into trust for purposes of housing, for conservation purposes, economic development purposes, et cetera. So it's slowed down, quite frankly. Okay, thank you. Mr. Cole. Thank you very much. I want to thank both of you for being here and, and your testimony. And uh, Mr. Allen, I particularly want to thank you. I probably will mention this several times <laughs> over the course of uh, – of the next couple of days uh, for raising this issue about the CMS classification of tribes as racial units. Uh, a lot of us have already sent pretty strongly worded letters to the administration. I know we have a joint letter, bipartisan letter, circulating that uh, my friend uh, Betty McCollum, who uh, co-chairs the Native American Caucus with me, have gone around getting Democrats and Republicans feel very, very strongly about this. Um, and it's uh, and I, you know at least in my letter I also sent a legal opinion from the chief attorney of our tribe who I, I think made the case pretty compellingly that uh, you're headed toward a lawsuit and so I want to use the opportunity of the hearing number one to thank you for raising the issue and I and I hope other people do as well I think getting it in the record frequently and often is good I hope uh, whether it's in this bill I have the good fortune of chairing the, the uh, uh, labor health and human services and education committee which is uh, you know, the one that's directly responsible for CMS and, and some of its funding. I, uh, you know, come put my friend, the chairman, on notice. We just need to work back and forth and decide whether we should mention this in the, the legislation, the appropriation. Uh, I'm inclined to want to do that in my bill, but I want to work with you on that. Uh, this is, it's worth noting, this is an administrative decision. And again, it's, uh, uh, based, I think, on a profound misunderstanding of what tribes are and what the trust obligation of the United States here is, and uh, it effectively uh, puts you under state jurisdiction in ways that you should not be under state jurisdiction. Uh, there's a big difference, and, and this isn't a demonstration project. I mean, my gosh, you don't do stuff like this in demonstration projects, for goodness sake. So I'm really pleased that so many people in Indian country caught it right away, you know, as soon as they saw the the uh, letter that went out on this decision, I think, in January. Uh, and uh, I've certainly been hearing from it uh, since then. I suspect the administration has. But uh, I just uh, checkmarked that as, uh, you know, I think an unintentional but a very real attack on tribal sovereignty that, uh, that uh, tribes and the National Congress of the American Indians and, frankly, those of us on both sides of the aisle that I think are generally allied with tribes ought to be pushing back really strong. You don't want this precedent established. You really don't. Uh, and I don't think the federal government wants to, uh, you know, pay for the lawsuits that I think are coming uh, if we try to operate that way. So thank you for raising the issue, uh, and, and uh, thank both of you for what you do for all of Indian Country in addition to your own tribe and your own region. And we thank you for your leadership, Congressman. Uh, it, it's a tough issue. We're meeting with the Secretary tomorrow. Um, on this topic as well, to push back the Office of Civil Rights is wrong. Uh, we agree with you, with uh, Chickasaw attorney, um, and uh, we, we just need to correct this wrong and, and the consequences of it. We're not opposed to work requirements. It's just different in Indian country because of, of the high unemployment problems that we have and, and how, you, how you check off that requirement. No, I couldn't, couldn't agree more, and uh, I think, uh, again, I think I'm like you. I, I'm not opposed. I actually support work requirements as a rule. I don't support tribes, you know, effectively being supervised by what states are going to do. And, you know, there's a big difference if the federal government does something and then devolves the power down to the state to let you do it. Uh, in the letter that I sent, I asked, asked uh, you know, you mentioned you, the statutory authority. You didn't cite any. I'd sure like to see, could you send us the statutory uh, sites and information that you based your decision on, and you mentioned civil rights concerns. Can you tell us what those are and point to those in law? Because I don't think they bear up to scrutiny very well. Uh, so uh, anyway, I just rest assured, we, this committee I know and many, many members in Congress beyond it take this really seriously, uh, and uh, we intend to push back really hard. And uh, if the administration wants to proceed down this course, then, uh, then we'll see where we end up. But uh, they better be ready. <laughs> because I don't think
don't think that memo is going to hold up very well by itself. But thanks for raising the issue. Very important to bring it up. Thank you. Yield Thank back. You, Thank you. Thank you. Have a great day. See you soon. Okay, we're next ready for our next panel. Good morning. I, I'm sure you heard our five-minute rule. We, we appreciate uh, your coming out, listen to your testimony today. And with that, uh, Michael, uh, Dr. Michael uh, Marshad, we're happy to represent, recognize you first. Good morning. I'm uh, Michael Marshand. I'm chairman for the Colville Tribes in Washington State. Uh, we're a confederation of 12 tribes, uh, a very, very rural area, very isolated area. I was looking through the archives and uh, uh, General Sherman rode through there and through the Civil War. He said, this is the most rugged and impassable place he's ever been. This would be a good place to put the Indians. Uh, <laughs> uh, we know how to get through the mountains, though. So, uh, but it still is that way. Uh, very small towns. Our towns are measured in hundreds, not thousands, usually. Uh, the big town, uh, Omak, is 4,500 people. Uh, and, and it's still basically that way. Uh, we. Uh, We've, we've been a natural resource-based economy forever. Uh, in the old days, we had salmon and buffalo. Uh, buffalo went away. Uh, and we also lost our salmon. We're in the upper Columbia River. And because of all the dams, uh, which benefit the Northwest greatly with billions of dollars and millions of jobs, uh, they, they create problems for us. And so our region is uh, still isolated, high unemployment, and, and so forth. And we're, we're trying to convert into modern new economies right now. And so for my... Um, so for today, what I'd like to say is that we'd, uh, we'd like to direct the IHS up, update the facility priority list systems for health facilities construction. They're operating under uh, these old time uh, lists and policies uh, which don't serve us well today. Uh, I was born in an IHS facility in the 1950s. It was since shut down. Uh, uh, today we don't have a hospital on a reservation even, <coughs> though, even though it's as big as some states and so we have to go off reservation for uh, services generally we do have clinics uh, uh, I just got word uh, this week that the, the local off reservation uh, hospital was talking about cutting off uh, baby delivery services so our young ladies are not too happy about that and I'm sure we'll be working more on that issue uh, uh, some of the old facilities are based on criteria I don't know if they make any sense anymore today uh, at all but, uh, so we just like to look at that again, I guess, and, and get these lists updated. Uh, we went through this with school system facilities and about 10 years ago, and the same things there. And, uh, and, and we, we just think we need uh, uh, we need hospitals, we need clinics, we need these sorts of things. And uh, uh, under the current policies, it's kind of um, very difficult. Under the current system, it takes 20 years to uh, complete construction on the lists they have, which I think are outdated. Uh, we need $8.2 billion needed for this whole list con construction. Uh, so, um, so that's a big issue for us. We'd like to get that updated. Um, next is forestry. Um, uh, I'm a doctor because of forestry. I'm a, I'm, I have a PhD in forestry from the University of Washington. And, uh, I was born and raised in the forest. And, th and that's our basis for our, our economy today. Um, we reject the proposed cuts and would like to see a $10 million increase to BIA forestry. Uh, we, we've suffered some devastating forest fires in the past few years, uh, and we still have not recovered from those issues. We need dollars to help uh, rebuild our forests, replant forests, and so forth. And we're doing all we can. Uh, we, have, we have forestry staff and greenhouses, and so we're, we're working on those things, but it's, it's going to take time and more resources. And they're very important to our economy. They provide a lot of the jobs. Uh, you know, a, a trees have a long value-added chain, and they, they really impact the country nationwide. Uh, uh, they provide jobs in the forest. Uh, those products go all over the country. We, we wholesale timber all over the United States. They make furniture, door frames, a uh, wide variety of products everywhere. So one of our biggest customers in the past was like Anderson Windows in uh, Minnesota. It's, it's, it's Every tree has a big impact, and they provide a lot of jobs. 
we'd, we'd also like to reject the proposed cuts and provide $20 million increase for BIA law enforcement to enable tribes to hire more police officers. Uh, we have a relatively small police force, even though our tribe's as big as uh, some states. Uh, uh, we were on chopping block years ago for termination. We were PL280 tribe, and so jurisdiction was turned over to the state. After those policies changed, we, got, we negotiated to get back our jurisdiction. And in that process, we were assured by the BIA and federal government that when this jurisdiction comes back, that funding would be provided for police and courts. And that's never really happened, you know. And we did get some initially, but since then, you know, the problems get worse all the time, but we have never seen this funding increase ever happen. And so we're, we're spending a lot of our money on, on police protection. And then we're like the rest of the country, we're getting increased problems from opioids and organized crime like you never used to have and uh, so forth. And so it's something we're dealing with. And we're also uh, uh, on the Canadian-US border, so we have border issues also. And uh, and uh, we need we need help. And we're doing what we can, but uh, but I think it's, it's really a national problem, you know. Um, that, that concludes my remarks, so thank you. Thank you, thank you, Doctor. And uh, next is Charlene Nelson, the chairperson for the Shoal Water Bay Tribe. Thank you for being here, each of you. I know that each of you are busy and you're here taking time to sit with us at table. And face to face, I truly believe that. Push, push the oh, pressure. Okay, sorry. <laughs> Microphones and I don't do too well. Also, I'm blind in my right eye and this I can see, so that really helps. <laughs> um, as you mentioned, I'm Charlene Nelson, Shawater Bay Chairwoman. I'm here to talk about needs that I see not only as our needs, some of them are personally our needs. I sent in my written, and this is just from the heart, um, as Billy Frank always spoke. So this is from the heart. Um, I look at health needs and safety needs are my top priorities, and I think they're the top priorities of every, every person that speaks here. Please, when you're looking at funding, do not cut health needs because we've come a long way. We're doing better, and I'm proud of that. I'm proud of where we are. And to celebrate uh, here with you today, we found a tribal member that had been gone for about uh, 65 to 67 years who had been taken at, at a very young age before memory, and we found him yesterday. So we celebrate that. We're a small tribe on the coast of Washington. It was very beautiful there. Come and visit. Uh, the uh, Akshi from, I don't know, was from speaking last year, but 105 highway t that connects us north was repaired um, last fall, and we now have access. I mean, it's, it's rocked, and I'm hoping it holds. Because that is something we always have to worry about, is our environment. Because the water is rising. We are right on the coast. We are uh, possibly six feet up from um, sea level. We thought of this years ago, and we started with the idea that we will buy land uphill, and we will build on it. We bought the land uphill. We haven't built on it because we needed a road up there that would take uh, heavy trucks and things like that. Well, there was the uh, storm of 2007 and second storm and third storm right in a row. I declared a state of emergency when it hit 139 on wind miles per hour because we had an area that was washing out on the road, which is a state or a county road, and our housing is just above that. The Corps came, and they worked until the mirrors on their trucks bent back, and they saved that area. The U.S. Army Corps, wonderful, straightforward people. Well, I can't say this is a state of emergency because we need to relocate up hill because we don't know. I mean, they say a tsunami could come. If a tsunami comes, it could wipe out our village. They say now 53 to 63 feet, the first wave. 
and we, we prepare for this. We've always been self-reliant. We have 20 minutes if that earthquake on the Cascadia happens offshore. If it's onshore, we sink six feet immediately. So we work to finish the road, and we have to have a road that will take heavy equipment so we can do uphill what we need to do, the housing, the moving our wellness center by the way we serve all people, Medicare, Medicaid, and anybody who comes in the door. We have two doctors, two dentists, and this is good. Again, priority health. I thank you for looking at that. Um, we need to relocate uphill, and we need help to do that. We started it. We started the planning, but we're going to need help with the, the road uphill. And I'm here to say and ask that we'll be sending all the materials along that you'll need to see. And we're not expecting the whole amount because that's an impossibility. It's going to be a lot. But so that we can do the next step and get fur further toward getting that hill to safety. For my people, I ask you, and I ask you to remember all the other tribes on the coast. We're all in the same boat except we're not in a boat, we're not in a canoe, we're standing there, and we are reliant. So I asked you to hear, please, what I'm saying as an elder and a chair um, to help us. Thank you. Masi. Thank you for your testimony. Next, uh, Esther uh, Lacero for the uh, Seattle Indian Health Board. Good morning, um, Chairman Calvert and Ranking Member McCollum. It's so nice to see you all again. Um, I really thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak. It's, it's always a privilege to speak with such incredible tribal leaders from the Pacific Northwest. Um, I'm learning a lot. I've now been in my role almost three years, and um, I have a lot to share with you. So first I'd like to say um, thank you for the $1.6 million increase in uh, FY 2018. It duly noted that it was $4 million over the President's budget, so very much thank you for that. Um, I think that you've heard from tribal leaders um, today, President Sharp, um, and Chairman Allen about the concerns regarding uh, political status of uh, sovereign nations. And although we as an urban Indian health program are not a sovereign nation, we will always stand with our tribal partners uh, to protect their political status. Um, we recognize that the Indian Health Service is a component of that trust responsibility. We also recognize our responsibility as an urban Indian health program in that ITU system of care. Um, so I just wanted to share a few things. Uh, Chairman Calvert, I think you and I had a discussion last year about the opioid crisis and kind of homelessness in Seattle. And I wanted to let you know the ways that we are working with our tribal partners to, um, to meet those needs and those crises. Um, we are currently working with the Cowlitz tribe, which has a site in, in Tequila, which is South Seattle. And we've actually established an MOU to provide mobile dental services there. Uh, we at the Seattle Indian Health Board are expanding our mobile dental services so that we can um, help the tribes with some of the dental needs that they have. And we're hoping to establish more of those partnerships and really build upon a coordinated care agreement um, opportunity. Um, the other thing that we're doing is we're partnering with uh, Seattle urban native nonprofits, uh, such as the Chief Seattle Club and Mother Nation to address the homeless needs. And we're leveraging um, the city of Seattle funding. It's $2.7 million to address those needs. Because if you recall, if you're American Indian or Alaska Native living in Seattle, you're seven times more likely to be homeless. We recognize homelessness as a precursor to poor health conditions. And so as a Seattle Indian Health Board, we know that we have to take a strong position in addressing that, that issue. Um, we also have a robust low-level bu um, buprenorphine uh, medically assisted treatment program. This is something that we established this year. I believe last year we were talking about the crisis and this year we have hired an addiction medicine doctor and we have 10 wavered prescribers and we've adapted our 65 bed residential treatment center to meet the needs, inpatient needs of folks with MAT. Uh, one of the things that has been challenging in regarding funding though is uh, when you have MAT uh, clients in residential treatment, it takes a lot more med management assistance. So we could definitely use some support around that when we think about um, the opioid funding. Um, also, I would just advocate that urban Indian health programs to be eligible for the opioid funding so that we can continue to uh, meet that need. Um, I'm sad to say that I'm here three years later still advocating for 100% FMAP and seeing little movement in the urban Indian parity bill. Um, 
The reason that's significant is, uh, Representative Cole, you pointed out earlier, as states gain more authority, particularly in healthcare, what happens to urban Indian health programs is we get pushed into mainstream. And that removes us from our responsibilities as an urban Indian health program in the ITU system of care. And what we would like to do is um, maintain our position in that continuum. We've had some successes where we've had a carve out in the state of Washington for SUD services, where we've been able to work directly with our tribe to ensure that they have access to our residential treatment facility. We'd like to see more things like that. Um, and so I, I'm grateful that you understand the impact that states can have. 100% uh, FMAP actually gives us leverage to do that with our states. It incentivizes the states to keep us um, intact as a full system of care. Um, and then finally, uh, because we've been working closely with our tribes, uh, particularly in Portland, um, the Portland area, uh, our tribal partners are taking an aggressive approach to get IHS to full funding. And quite frankly, they want to do that within 10 years. And so my ask is pretty significant, and that is to get the urban Indian line item to 81 million. Um, and that is on track with our tribal partners and our initiative to move that forward. Now, I'm particularly interested in advocating for that today uh, with regarding the threats to Medicaid consistent threats, because we've met uh, leveraged Medicaid to kind of keep our system intact and in balance and moving forward and progressing, um, but I'm, I'm nervous about that every single day. So with that, I would just like to conclude and say thank you again for allowing me to be here. Thank you. Thank you for your testimony. Uh, next, uh, Zalano uh, Soliskin, uh, council member of the Yakima Nation Tribal Council. Good morning. Mr. Chairman Telbert, Ranking Member McComb, and distinguished committee members, I am uh, Delano Sluskin, and I have the honor of serving as an elected official on the Yakima Tribal Council, where I chair the legislative committee. Uh, we want to express our deep appreciation to Chairman Calvert and others on this subcommittee who have continued to stand by our nation's commitment to its Indian tribes. In enacting the fiscal year 18 appropriations bill, you have demonstrated once again, that Indian Affairs is a bipartisan uh, area where members of both parties uh, know, as did Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black in 1960, in opining on Indian law, wrote, great nations like great men should keep their word, and we appreciate your, your efforts there. We express our appreciation as you have allowed for some growth in federal funding for important tribal programs and resisted proposals that seem terribly disconnected to the reality of life in Indian country that would have severely cut back funding to some of the most impoverished people in the United States. <coughs> With your help, perhaps someday the Indian people can get to the point where we have something even more remotely re resembling parity with the rest of the population outside Indian country. My written statement discusses four areas. In two of them, we have a similar problem, which is, seeming, which is the seeming inability of the BIA to fill federal positions on our reservation at the BIA Yakima Agency that are presently vacant. First, forestry. We have a 650,000 acre, acres of forested land, the largest tribally owned forest in the United States, but we cannot cut timber until we have complied with federal regulations. We do not object to these uh, reg regulations. We are not able to undertake sustainable harvest practices unless we have sufficient staff to manage the work required. <coughs> Excuse me. Presently, the BIA has 33 vacancies within its Yakima Agency branch of forestry. As a result, not one new timber cell was approved in 2017. Compar compare that to the fact in theory, we have an annual allowable harvest of over 140 million board feet of timber. A second area is ir irrigation. The Wapta Irrigation Project is one of the largest in the BIA system, and the Bureau has allowed it to fall apart with an immense ba backlog of deferred maintenance. Like the forestry branch, the BIA has, all has a tremendous number of vacancies in positions that are supposed to be filled so that this project can operate in that agriculture can survive in one of the premier fruit, hops, and grape growing regions in the entire United States. A project that historically had more than 120 employees is now staffed with only 48. The irrigation 
project administrator himself has identified the need for a minimum of 93 employees, nearly double the current level. Basic work that is essential for the project to be viable has not taken place. <coughs> we ask this committee to direct the BIA, BIA to fill these vacancies at the ACME Agency's Forestry and Irrig Irrigation Divisions or report back to you within 45 days of the enactment of the fiscal year 19 interior bill as to why they cannot fill them. Clearly, the BIA has a problem with its human resources area, as they just seem incapable of hiring people to fill slots where their employment charts show vacancy. Please help, please help us in this regard. I also want to tell you about our school. Our existing Yakima Nation Tribal School was built in 1965 by the Yakima Catholic Diocese. As such, it is now over a half century old. We'd like to build a new school, including one that our students can take pride in instead of one that is lacking in so much. We shared the concern of many tribes when the BIA came up with its 2016 school facilities replacement list. The process was flawed. One example of this is the fact that we could not post to the FMIS system nor were we allowed to access to it. A new process for facilities replacement should be established that is open and transparent. It seems to be very uh, closed right now. Finally, Mr. Chairman, on February 17th, the Yakima Tribal Council declared a public safety crisis and enacted an emergency resolution responded to increased criminal activity on the reservation and in particular to rap rampant crime taking place in a small town of White Swan. We have hired clerks and police officers at the White Swan substation who just started last week. We are, in, we are very much in need of supplemental funding for our law enforcement efforts and any help or direction your committee can give to the BI in this regard would be most appreciated. Uh, we're just like all other communities, we have a lot of opiate issues and, uh, and then as a result it creates a lot of pro crime problems so any help you can give us we appreciate thank you very much thank you and thank you for your uh, for your testimony um, I know that uh, your tribe uh, your location is very remote I live in that area a number of years ago it's a beautiful area though and uh, I can see where the, there's some challenges there in getting uh, hospitals, clinics, and so forth up in that area. But uh, we've plussed up those accounts. Hopefully we can get some attention to, to your area and uh, make things better. As far as the, the uh, forestry, uh, hopefully uh, the U.S. Forest Service and others, the state of, the state of Washington is way ahead of us, uh, you know, as far as how they handle the, the forest. You probably know a lot more about that than we do since you're, that's your occupation. But uh, uh, we, uh, we need to get our our forest business back in shape. So uh, we look for you to, to help us out. Any ideas, please share them with this committee. Uh, also, uh, we, we've got a little extra money for BIA law enforcement, so hopefully we can help across the, uh, across the nation. Uh, I know the, co I've been, I remember your testimony from last year and this coastline issue, that's probably not getting any better. And we're probably, uh, so there are studies being done now to how to build that road and Yes, it is. We have uh, hired somebody and paid for him to do the preliminaries, mm -hmm. and we're working on it. We're just trying to speed it up. And the Corps of Engineers involved in this? Uh, not yet. We have a Corps of Engineers working on the berm, which they actually are repairing again from the storm December 18th of 2018. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, any, uh, any help we can give you, just please let us know. And... Uh, I know that I was in uh, Portland recently, and I, I know not all the homeless in Portland are Native American. It seems that it's a huge problem. What percentage is Native American? Seattle. It's Seattle. Uh, well, t it's just under 2%. 2%? Mm -hmm. But uh, that's a, it seems like a whole long, along the West Coast, we have a huge, that's what I was thinking about. a huge problem. So uh, uh, anything we can do to help alleviate that problem is uh, certainly important. And uh, and also timber operations again. That's uh, I'm sure you're working with the U.S. Forest Service as well as your own uh, with the BIA and the rest. Uh, Don, I, I developed a program with the Forest Service. 
Yes, we're trying to pr develop some programs with them. Okay, good. And uh, hopefully, uh, you know, we, we did have some money, some additional money for the new school program. I don't know where they're at on the priority list, but uh, hopefully uh, we can get to that sooner than we would have had. Okay, with that, any uh, questions for this panel? Yeah, there you go. Thank you, Chairman, and I thank every, uh, each one of you for coming and sharing your priorities with us. Um, uh, Chairwoman, Chairwoman Nelson, uh, I'm really glad you mentioned the challenges on the move to higher ground. I think this is one of the areas where uh, we have an opportunity and an obligation to help communities now because the longer we wait, um, we may get to the point where um, it's too late. Uh, this is an area where uh, we've seen articles, the New Yorker had an article called The Really Big One, which I encourage my colleagues to read. If you haven't read it, don't read it at bedtime because it's really uh, quite frightening. The potential for the Cascadia subduction zone to have an earthquake and really have it be the worst disaster in recorded if history. That happens. So yeah, we're cooked. <laughs> That's why we're yeah. Um, but even uh, CNN and Facebook did a, uh, I know um, uh, President Sharp was here, they did a, a like a five minute video on the challenges tribes are facing now with regard to uh, flooding issues. And um, I just, yeah, go ahead. I, I, I just wanted to thank you for raising, but if you have any other comments you want to make on that regard, I think it's no, worth I just emphasizing. I just want to say to you, our, our thank you, thank you for saying all those things because this is what is in the paper and this is the Chinook Observer and all the other papers. And by the way, Willapa Bay is the target for the whole West Coast. And we are the north, a little bit north of the point of Willapa Bay. I, I really appreciate your concern because that's my concern as an elder. Um, we take care of our earth and our water and our land, not just for ourselves, but we take care of it because we borrow it from our children. This is their land and our children's children's children. And we all are like that. By the way, I, I know I'm kind of uh, a little close to this. So we are funding an early earthquake system uh, for the entire West Coast. And uh, that includes the state of Oregon and Washington. And uh, as you know, a lot of the tsunamis are brought on by earthquakes. And so uh, hopefully we'll have some warning once we have this system up and operating, uh, hopefully sometime in 2020. So we should be up and operating uh, in that area by then. So hopefully that'll be helpful. Mr. Cole? Yeah, I don't want to break the serious mood, but I, I just have to get it on the record. I watched a really exciting Kentucky Derby this weekend, and it's nothing to the Ilmac Stampede suicide race. So <laughs> if you haven't seen it, you need to go see it. It is a pretty spectacular event, but uh, it's a beautiful, beautiful place, wonderful people. Good to have all of you here today. I've seen the video of it. My goodness. you got to see it. Yeah, I mean, the video doesn't do anything like And then you have to... I was had the opportunity to do this, and people were very kind, and they let us sort of mix and mingle at the top with the horses and the riders. And I tell you, those are the bravest animals and bravest people I've ever met in my life. Uh, when you when you see what they do, but it's an extraordinary event. I've never seen anything it's like. It's all it. my crazy relatives. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I'm the one person in my family that doesn't race there. But that's <laughs> but why you're here. But that's, that why, river, that's why you're a doctor and highly educated. That river <laughs> The river's at the flood stage right now, and so back home everyone's getting ready and they're filling sandbags and all that sort of stuff. So the river is going to be high. So it's same time as Sturgis. So I'll see you there. And okay, great. Okay, well, thank you very much for your testimony. We appreciate having you. Mossy to all of you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for uh, attending. Uh, that's our next uh, our next panel. First, we're going to have uh, 
Brian Kadusby, chairman of the Swiminish Indian Tribal Community. Good morning, uh, Chairman Calvert and Ranking Member McCollum and members of the subcommittee. Uh, my name is Spipots, Brian Cladisby. I'm the chairman of the Swinomish Tribe and uh, uh, recently stepped down as president of the National Congress of American Indians. Swinomish is located about an hour north of Seattle. We live on an island. We are a treaty tribe. Uh, my dad's 85, uh, Mike Cladisby Sr. Uh, he is going to be going fishing in our first commissioner commercial salmon fishing opening on Sunday at 85. Uh, his Indian name is Kel Kaltzit. His his uh, great-grandfather, Kel Kaltzit, put his ex on the Point Elliott Treaty for our tribe in 1855. So when you put it in that perspective, it was not that long ago. Uh, fishing continues uh, to be a mainstay for us. Uh, we've already been out there getting halibut, uh, getting prawns. Like I said, king salmon will start Sunday, and then next month, Dungeness crab will start. So to say that um, uh, treaty fishing rights is not important to us is an understatement, and we always say uh, when the tide's out, the table is set. <laughs> so I, I want to talk about three issues. One of them is uh, the opioid crisis. And as you are aware, uh, the pharmaceutical corporations and the doctors help create um, the national opioid epidemic, which represents one of the greatest public health challenges of the modern era, and now they are turning to Congress to deal with it, to clean it up. And the statistics don't lie. The overdose rate is twice the general population in Indian country. Uh, we've got the highest drug overdose death rate in Indian country, and we have the largest percentage change in drug overdose deaths uh, from 1999 to 2015, connection to when uh, OxyContin was first started to be introduced. Uh, and we uh, had our first overdose death here four years ago. An 18-year-old died in my community. And uh, we had to start a This Has to Stop program. And in the last four years, we saved 50 tribal members' lives. There's 1,000 members. And so 50 of those were saved in the last four years by this program. So we're making a difference. In fact, we're making such a big difference. Swinomish on January 8th opened the largest opioid uh, treatment, outpatient treatment center in the Northwest. And there's only two uh, treatment centers like ours in the nation. Swinomish and John Hopkins University runs a very unique opioid treatment center. And it's probably one of the first in Indian country. And we didn't look to the local, the county, the state, or the federal IHS for any dollars. We did this opioid treatment center with 100% funding from the Swinomish tribe because we could not wait for the federal government and IHS to step in to help us with this pro problem. Now, $10 billion has been uh, allocated for this opioid uh, epidemic. And if you funded this epidemic based on statistics who needed it the most, Indian country would be at the top of the list. Because we are such a small segment of society, though, we're only getting 1.5% of that $10, million, $10 billion, uh, which is not adequate. If we go down the road that we're going now and you allocate only $150 million to this project, you're only going to hit the tip of the iceberg. And I cannot underestimate the importance that this is in Indian country. And you got to understand there's a lot, not a lot of tribes out there that still have the infrastructure to do what Swinomish has done. A lot of tribes do not have that. And if you make this a competitive grant process, once again, the poorest of the poor, those tribes with the least infrastructure in place to be able to get grants in place, to have the professionals to run it and operate it, they're going to get left out. And so uh, we would encourage that um, you increase this to a modest $200 million. That's 2% of the funding. Uh, to look at the magnitude, and uh, we're also concerned that distributing the funds through a competitive grant uh, process will leave many tribal communities out, as stated earlier by the National Indian Health Board. Competitive grants are a long-term solution, and they diver divert scarce uh, resources from their regular duties, so we're asking that you give us a modest increase to 2% for the citizens in the United States that need it the most. Uh, number two, I'd like to talk about natural resources. And once again, we're concerned with the President's budget request. The 2019 budget request proposes a, almost a $50 million cut to trust natural resource management account. And as I stated, we're a treaty tribe, and this is very important to us. It also includes a $15 million decrease for rights protection implementation, which provides base funding for Swinomish. 
And uh, it also cuts out zero, the 9.8 million that the subcommittee provided for tribal climate resiliency. And I know there's a segment of the political spectrum that does not believe in climate change. I would like DC to have a hearing s that says, environmental impacts to indigenous communities. You're hearing it over and over and over again. We are grand, ground zero for impacts to our communities. We're a place-based society. We just can't move. A lot of us need to, though. You've heard it already in the testimony. So, you know, we don't want to debate anybody on what's causing it. We just want to show you the effects that are happening in our community. So please listen to tribal leaders across the country uh, when it comes to this. And finally, you've heard repeatedly the concern uh, with um, labor in HHS, uh, the subcommittee in the administration, to resolve an emerging but very troubling issue developing with the HHS. W Billy Frank always told us, tell your story, tell your story, tell your story. And don't get tired of telling your story, uh, because a lot of times when you come back here to DC, a lot of times it goes in one ear and out the other. So you gotta keep repeating the story. So this is very important to us, and in various correspondence with Indian tribes in January of this year, HHS has signaled that it is stepping back from long-standing precedent and may no longer consider Indian tribes as governments for certain purposes. That's a concern. In response, tribes' concerns um, about exempting Indian tribes from Medicaid work and community engagement requirements. HHS has indicated that it is unable to do so because of civil rights issues, specifically the HHS Office of Civil Rights apparent interpretation um, that such an exemption would be race-based, a very serious concern. And in closing, the Supreme Court has repeatedly upheld the unique political status and the government-to-government -government relationship between tribes in the United States. And this includes the seminal 1974 decision in Morton v. Mancari, which affirmed that federal classifications fulfilling federal obligations to Indians are not based on race, but instead on a political relationship with the tribes and the federal government. The fact that this subcommittee has funded programs for decades that directly benefit Indian tribes demonstrates how enshrined this concept is in federal Indian policy. And this is a slippery slope, and I thank Congress and our senators who have reached out to CMS and the administration to let them know the concern that uh, you have for Indian country. And I know uh, you as uh, my trustee, as our trustee for 573 nations, uh, will have our back once again. Thank, thank you, you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, thank you. And re I just remind uh, this panel that we're under a five-minute rule, so please try to stay within. I, I apologize. Possible. I took a little Ron Allen liberties there. Okay. <laughs> uh, <laughs> he had a double time. <laughs> uh, he, Jerry, uh, Jeremy Sullivan, chair, uh, chairman of the Port Gamble Skalayam tribe, to recognize for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, for the, thank you to the committee for having us here. I'm very humbled by all the tribal leadership in the room, and and being in front of you guys is, uh, is quite an honor for me. And so thank you for letting us testify on many issues that we have. Uh, my tribe is the Port Gamble Skalalem tribe. We're a, tri a small tribe up on the uh, Kitsap Peninsula. We have approximately 1,300 tribal members. Uh, the president's proposed budget request causes us deep concern. As a result, negative impacts of our treaty right, protected rights, and ability to administer essential government programs for our members. The President's proposed cuts in the BIA fly in the face of treaty obligations and the federal trust responsibility. And while we welcome the President's request overall to increase IHS, more is needed. Thank you all for your hard work, um, especially for the fiscal year 2018 omnibus, where you restored funding to criti critical programs, enacted increases, and included helpful report language on significant issues. We implore you to take the same approach this year. We also encourage the use of formula funding for Indian programs, not competitive grants. Competitive grants pit tribes against tribes, and many that don't have the resources will not get these grants, as Brian was just pointing out. I'd like to turn to a few specific funding priorities. Funding for envi environmental protection, rights protection implementation, the health of the Hood Canal, which is part of the Puget Sound, is directly connected to who we are as indigenous people. Substance and commercial harvest support our tribal members, and tribal and other local businesses rely on this income to generate that we generate by harvest. And, and our harvest activities are inherent to our culture. My parents taught all three of their sons how to harvest fin fish and shellfish, and all the kinds that throughout the, our usual custom area 
We are teaching our children just as my grandparents taught my parents. Our Natural Resources Department is, front, is on the front lines of protecting and restoring resources upon which our treaty protected rights and our culture depend on. Nearly one third of us, the funding from, e, uh, from, EP, uh, from the EPA, either directly or through partnerships. We depend on EPA funds for about 22% of our Natural Resources Department staff. Cuts to EPA funding would be devastating to our tribe and would lead to a multitude of economic, social, culture, and ecological problems. I just got to be cognizant of that little timer here. Further, National Estuary Program based funds are crucial th for the Puget Sound Partnership, which is key to implementation for our recovery plan. And the Puget Sound Geographic Program and Multi State Pacific Coastal Salmon Recovery Funds from NOAA help us with our salmon recovery. Loss of these critical funding elements will significantly impact the entire system and disrupt our collaborative recovery efforts. Please protect EPA, NOAA, and the BIA budgets. We ask that you reject the President's proposed cuts to the BIA's rights protection implementa implementation account. This program is needed for proper management of off-reservation harvest and habitat protection activities. I'd like to turn to public safety, justice, and tribal courts. The President's budget request would cut every line item in public safety, justice, and tribal courts account. This would have a devastating impact to our tribal court. Our, our justice system is key to our addressing increased levels of violent crime, methamphetamine, and opioid abuse, and the community impacts that will result. With only one judge, one prosecutor, our court hears approximately 350 cases a year. Our court services staff also provides services to our community, including helping domestic violence and victims, or domestic violence victims and people who suffer from addiction who want to get back on track. We rely heavily on federal government for a coordinated, multi-system jurisdictional approach including the tribe's reentry program, which has become a national model within Indian country through funding of the Second Chance Act demonstration grant. We cannot afford budget cuts as we strive to refine court processes and our land load increases. To strengthen our tribal court and court service programs, we encourage you to maintain your commitment to public safety and justice on tribal lands and increase funding for the tribal courts. Human Services, the President proposed cuts to Social Services, Welfare Assistance, and Indian Child Welfare Act would result in the harm to already vulnerable people, including children. Our tribe has always been progressive in Indian Child Welfare. We are the first in the country to operate the Title IV-E program directly, and we are the only tribe with a, a 4-E waiver. If the proposed cuts occur, we would, ha would lose a family care coordinator, leaving us woefully understaffed when we already struggle to meet the overwhelming need Please reject the proposed cuts and instead increase the funding for these essential programs. Brian already talked about IHS. I totally agree with him. I'd like to talk about education. We propose the President's proposed to reduce funding for Johnson O'Malley program. This program is important to us and reducing these funds would have a negative impact on the services we provide for our kids. And I, diabetes continues to be uh, a serious problem for our tribe, so please SBDI continue to support that. Thank you for having us. Thank you, and uh, thank you all for your testimony. Um, oh, I forgot. Please, down the line, almost forgot you. Andrew, I, I, I apologize. Andrew C. Joseph, Jr., Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board. You're recognized for five minutes. Uh, uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Culvert and Ranking Member McCullen and members of the subcommittee. Uhutkani uh, Squeeze Badger is my name. Um, I chair the Health and Human Services Committee for the Cabo Confederate Tribe Business Council and also co also chair the Northwest Portland Area Indian Health Board and, and I co-chair the National IHS Budget Work Group. I have submitted my testimony for the record and will summarize our recommendations. Let me begin by talking about the sacrifices many of our ancestors made with their lives loss of ancestral lands, rights to survival in exchange for the federal government's promise of protection, health care, education, to name a few. We would, would not be at this place asking year to year for federal government to uphold the, its trust treaty obligations to our people. There is no question our people suffer the highest rates of disease for most health indicators. My written testimony highlights these terrible health statistics. The da data, along with the trust and treaty obligations, require Congress to provide an adequate level of funding for the IHS budget 
and commitment to fully fund IHS. Let me first say that we oppose the president's proposed elimination of funding for community health representatives, our health education, tribal management grants, cuts to the Indian health professionals and self-governance funding in FY 2019. We also oppose the president's budget request to move the special diabetes program for Indians from a mandatory to discretionary funding. A change from mandatory to discretionary could lessen SDPI as a priority compared to other IHS programs leading to decreased funding and program stability. The president's request in FY 2019 proposes an overall decrease of 368 million to services and facilities not including contract support costs under FY 2018 enacted level. Unfortunately, IHS health programs will suffer con the consequences if IHS is not funded in FY 2018 enacted level with inflation, population, and pay act increases. We respectfully urge Congress to commit to fully fund IHS pursuant to the FY 2019 recommendations of the IHS Tribal Budget Formulation Work Group. For the FY 2019, the work group requests 32 uh, billion phased in over 12 years with an in initial budget increase of 33% to get IHS on a 12 year track to for full funding at the Minimum, in, in order to maintain current services, IHS must receive funding of 268 million, not including fully funding contract support costs to cover inflation and population growth above the 2018 enacted level and 300 million in program increases. <coughs> we recommend a program increase of 50 million to the purchase and deferred care PRC program is extremely important to the Portland area since we do not have any hospitals and must rely on a PRC program for in inpatient care. Uh, PRC was flatlined from FY 2015 to 2016. This reduced the purchasing power of the Northwest tribes. We also support the program increase of 150 million to the alcohol and substance abuse services addressed the opioid crisis. President's budget requests 150 million for the FY 2019 for the IHS tribal <coughs> opioid prevention treatment and recovery support. This is a good start, but more funding is needed with the multiple commitment with increases annu annually for protection or population growth and inflation. These funding funds must be available to all tribes without the burden of competitive grants. We recommend the increase of health construction funding opportunities for the Northwest tribes like the small ambulatory grant, the joint venture program. We have also spoken to some of the congressional representative staff about the proposed for initiative demonstration regional specialty care referral center in the Northwest and would appreciate the opportunity to meet with the committee and staff to fully explain the proposal and how we can move forward. We also recommend the phase in funding to add new hepatitis C miracle drugs to the IHS formula. Our, all our people should have access to these life saving drugs. Last, we ask the subcommittee members to join the Native American Caucus letter to Honorable Alex Azar and Honorable Seema Verma at the HHS requesting rescission of CMS policy decision on Medicaid work requirements and for meaningful consultation with tribes. Thank you for this um, time to uh, present to you. Thank you, and that sounds like I just have uh, some questions. Let's turn it on. And uh, it seems like there's no uh, corner in this country where this opioid uh, uh, crisis is not uh, hit that every every income group every 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 part of the country it's a it's a horrific uh, problem and uh, we'll we'll work with you to see make sure that uh, the proper percentage of resources uh, get to Indian country for treatment and uh, get people off off this stuff I guess it's once people are on it it's heck to get it off uh, so it's it's a real real uh, real difficulty 
but as you know, on s as when the pre president proposed his budget, we'll be, uh, Betty and I and the rest of the committee will be reviewing through it and uh, we will, I'm sure, be making decisions that will be good for uh, Indian country as we do every year. Uh, obviously, I've heard the issue on, on formula funding versus grants, especially the poor tribes that don't have the ability to write grants some of the more wealthier tribes understand that. Uh, we're trying to get more money into health care. I know that's an ongoing problem. We have done that the last few years, and uh, we hope to continue to make work. And I, again, apologize for uh, if Tom Cole was here earlier about this uh, unfortunate issue in HHS right now. So uh, we're, we're here and we're, we're, we're working on it and trying to get that resolved. So anything else, uh, Betty? I'd like to thank everybody for their testimony, and as a couple of people have been looking anxiously at the, the, the lights changing, we have your full testimony in front of us, and so that's so helpful. And so one of the things I was doing, Mr. Sullivan, I was, I was kind of filling in the blanks with some of the things that uh, you weren't able to talk about. And just for the record, there has been uh, conversations, one of the things in your testimony talks about full and advanced funding and the way that that could uh, bring um, reliability, predictability, and better health care outcomes for our, our tribal brothers and sisters. And so that is something that uh, there are conversations being had uh, going on with different working groups with that. But as you point out, the stability could be even in medical personnel recruitment, which we know we're having a, a, a dickens of a time making um, you know young, young professionals uh, go out to some very remote areas uh, who still have large student loans and that through payments. So we're looking at a, at a number of, of things to put that together, and that's one of them. But just, uh, Mr. Chair, a, a comment on, on the opioid. I wanted to look up the number um, 200, uh, excuse me, uh, 52,494 uh, uh, lethal drug overdoses that are directly contributed to the problem that we're talking about today in this room. But there's many, many more lives that are impact, um, you know, permanently um, in, in many other ways, both uh, whether it's a, a physical accident that takes place while somebody is, is using one of these drugs or mental in, impairment that, that happens because of all the things that we're finding out goes on with, with brain chemistry. And then there's the children that are born addicted. So this, this is impacting a lot more uh, individuals than even the number that I just, uh, that I just mentioned. Um, one of the things that my state was looking at doing um, was to do a penny a pill. In other words, for every opioid that was prescribed, there would be a penny that would go into a fund um, for, for treatment, for prevention and that. Unfortunately, that didn't go anywhere. But the federal government and uh, our individual communities cannot pick up the cost for what needs to happen to address this ep epidemic. And those that stood to make great profit and in my opinion misrepresented uh, to Congress, to doctors, to patients what these pills were going to do, um, they need to um, be held accountable uh, for sharing some of those profits back um, to, and that's just my opinion uh, on it. Um, the pr testimony mentions methamphetamines. If one of you, if we just take a second, uh, and I'm putting somebody on the spot, but whoever wants to jump in, the meth problem is still a problem in rural parts of our country. It's also a problem in Indian country. Are the um, solutions that are out there, we need to change them from grant to formula. I hear that loud and clear. Are the, are the solutions and, and the opportunities out there flexible enough to allow you to um, address methamphetamines hand in hand with opioids, or is this something that the committee needs to look at? Well, um, I, I also um, am the co-chair for this AMSA uh, tribal work, work uh, technical work group and, or committee and, and um, um, you know, what, what we've been working on there is, is um, um, trying to get um, uh, SAMHSA to, and, and, and there's proven, it's been proven that some of our traditional practices actually work better than, than uh, um, you know, going to uh, 
a, a different type of provider. Um, Daryl Strawberry is a member of a work group that uh, that that we get to meet with kind of jointly, and 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 they use a, what they call a faith based um, a practice on on getting people you know off off of those types of drugs and and. Um, you know, I usually chime in right after him and, and say that a lot of our own traditional practices is actually faith-based. It's it's um, like like on the coast we have our canoe families and and uh, and and to me I see um, a lot of our people when once they get um, into one of those families or into our longhouse on our side of the mountains, um, they they tend to um, you know. Uh, find, find, find something that that appeals to them. Uh, that that I guess it attracts them to um, get off of the, the the pills or or the the methamphetamines. Uh, the Healing Lodge of Seven Nations is a youth treatment center in Spokane that is is known in the nation as one of the best treatment facilities in the nation. And uh, uh, Pam Hyde. The, Former director of SAMHSA uh, visited there and said that <laughs> that it was one of the best ones that she's ever seen. But it uses our traditional practices and and music. You know, kids like music too, and and um, so that attracts them to them and it, it works. The the you know the canoe families they drum and they sing and you know it, it brings brings in that higher power that makes them want to walk a straight up road. Thanks, Chairman, and uh, thanks to each of you for being here. <clears throat> a, a few of the tribal leaders have mentioned something, Chairman Sullivan, that you mentioned, and that's uh, Puget Sound funding. I, I want to publicly thank the Chairman uh, for, despite the fact that we've seen proposals from the administration to reduce funds, um, thankfully that's not happened out of, out of this committee and out of this House. Uh, it's a big deal. I was hoping you could just speak very briefly to the important role that that geographic funding plays in terms of protecting the treaty right. Well, I'm sure all of us could, but um, so for the treaty rights, you know, we've been working so hard to, to bring back the salmon, and with the salmon we come, we talk about habitat environment, and we talk about herring and other feeder fish, and, and uh, all of these things play a role in what we're trying to get accomplished. Um, years ago, my mom was on tribal council, and uh, save our salmon was was a big deal. Save the whales was was uh, very popular, um, but they quickly realized you couldn't save anything without saving the environment, which it, it uh, surrounded by it. Um, and our treaty right isn't just about you know shellfish and and the salmon, even though those are a huge part of what we harvest and eat. They wouldn't be there without clean streams, without um, habitat that has um, forced forageable fish in them. So. For us, uh, there's so many things that have to happen in order for the recovery effort to sustain itself. And, um, you know, we talk about protecting our tree rights. I was practicing the tree right when I was a kid by harvesting clams and, and, um, and finfish. I didn't know I was. I was just doing what my parents taught me to do. And my son doesn't realize when he goes out crabbing that he's practicing the tree right. He's going crabbing and he's actually much better at it than I am these days. <laughs> so um, it's, it's uh, something that, you know, we need to sustain the environment and bring back the salmon and, the, and all of the fin fish um, to keep our culture and our identity alive. So. Okay. Thanks, Chairman. Thank you. And I thank this panel. Appreciate your coming out here to Washington every year. Okay. You all have a great day. So. Thank, thank, thank you, you for, um, for for uh, doing like like was said earlier, you know a lot of the potential cuts like the snap and the you know the um, lie heap and and uh, you know I always uh, put in a word for impact date as well. But the farm bill and the snap, you know, we need to make sure that that gets approved as well. And well, the farm bill's high on our agenda. Okay, next uh, for our next panel. Aureen, I think you're on this next panel. Uh, Casey, Phil, Mollyn.
missing uh, Malian. Is she Malian's here? Nope. Okay. Okay. Well, welcome. And uh, you know we're under the five-minute rule, so I'm just uh, pointing that out. So we appreciate that. And we'll start with Casey. Casey, you recognize for uh, Casey Mitchell, who's the chairman of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission. You recognize for five minutes. Thank you. Good morning, uh, Chairman Talbert, Ranking Member McCollum, and uh, committee members. Um, Tots Mary, Oikolo, Ina Monique, the we add to that to a hike. Soyapo Timki, Casey Mitchell, and uh, I'm just saying good morning in my own language and uh, and thanking you. And uh, my Native American name, which is from the Nimipu tribe, is Sun Necklace, and my English name is Casey Mitchell. Uh, I'm a member of the Nespers Tribe Executive Committee and the chairman of the Columbia River Intertribal Fish Commission, uh, which is more commonly known as CRITFIC. Uh, uh, it is my pleasure to address you today regarding funding needs for CRIFIC and the fisheries programs for our member tribes. The Yakima Nation, Nez Perce tribes, Umatilla tribes, and the Warm Springs tribes. We conduct a comprehensive, we conduct a comprehensive treaty rights implementa implementation program which ensures compliance with our tribal treaties, court orders, regional intergovernmental agreements, and international salmon treaties. We are leaders in ecosystem manage, management working in collaboration with five states, 13 agencies, and uh, private partners. While many of the Pacific Coast salmon stocks remain in distress, our tribes are building Columbia Basin success acre by acre, tributary by tributary, and stock by stock. Columbia Basin stocks form the backbone of fisheries from Idaho to southern Alaska, valued in hundreds of millions of dollars annually. Rights protection implementation dollars have allowed this success to happen. Rights implementation dollars provide, provide direct support, but also, importantly, help us leverage hundreds of millions of other public and private dollars. But the need is still high. Specifically, under the Columbia River Fisheries Management is the U.S. versus Oregon. Our cornerstone legal agreement has a new 10-year management plan that puts more responsibilities on tribes, particularly in harvest monitoring and conservation enforcement. The Columbia River Treaty between the U.S. and Canada was originally negotiated without tribes at the table. We intend to be a part of the treaty modernization when the re renegotiation begins this summer. Also, the U.S.-Canada Pacific Salmon Treaty Agreement includes new tribal responsibilities. And, uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, I want to speak more, speak for a moment about the 31 federally owned tribal fishery sites along the lower Columbia River. These sites were created to replace river access for tribal members lost when the dams were built. The sites have been in the media over the past several years due to their distressed conditions. We're working with the Northwest Delegation and the Corps of Engineers on housing solutions, but the Bureau of, Indo Fair, but the Bureau of Indo Indian Affairs must play a role in a broader solution. We appreciate the, that Congress has made two requests of the Bureau of Indian Affairs to provide a needs assessment for the, fish, for the fishing access sites, but to our knowledge, the BIA has yet to deliver that assessment. I can tell you firsthand the needs, the needs of at the sites are, they fall into four main categories safety, sanitation, law enforcement, and long-term maintenance funds. We request robust and public safety and justice, which supports enforcement of federal laws at the fishing sites. We also request a one-time recapitalization 
of the site's operation and maintenance fund to support annual operation and maintenance funding for the sites through 2045. I have another fisheries related request of the subcommittee. We would like the we would like a general accounting office evaluation of the federal requirements to mass marking all hatchery salmon. In the Columbia, this requirement is becoming more and more costly and unnecessary as we have seen with the summer Chinook and fall Chinook management. Salmon managers should be provided a latitude to make case by case decisions whether to mark fish and if so, in, an, in, in the appropriate percentages. Um, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, tes to testify today. Um, we will be pleased to provide you any additional information that this subcommittee may require. Thank that is my testimony. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Phil. Phil Wiggins. Uh, Fisher Tribal Timber Council. Thank you, Chairman Calverts, um, members of the subcommittee, good morning, and thank you for this opportunity. It's an honor to be here. I'm Phil Rigdon, president of the Intertribal Timber Council, for whom I'm testifying this morning for. I'm also overseeing Department of Natural Resources for the Yakama Nation. First off, I want to thank the subcommittee for its support um, for timber tribes over the recent years. After the devastating fires of 2015, where the U.S. government basically walked away from its trust responsibility, your assistance has helped us move forward towards recovery. I particularly want to thank you for directing a report in the fiscal year 2018, um, fiscal year 2018 from BIA and Interior Department of Wa uh, Wildland Fire Office on how they set their priorities for suppressing wildfire on tribal trust forests and for rehabilitating our forests after the fires. We hope we'll have a report, um, we'll have an opportunity to at least review the report and comment on what is returned back to Congress. We also appreciate your continued help in working um, with our federal forest neighbors through the F Tribal Forest Protection Act and similar laws to protect our resources from the fire and disease from those neighboring lands. The health and economic viability of the broader forest landscape is critically important and is a principal focus of the Intertribal Timber Council. For fiscal um, year 2019, we continued um, to urge the committee to provide more adequate and equitable funding for the BI's forestry program. At current levels, federal support for BI trust management of our um, timber is still only one third um, of that per acre as when you compare it to the Forest Service. Both today and over the past 40 years, this has um, held, held down our timber cell to only half of the volume of, uh, of which our plans are are approved and it's costing us jobs and revenue. We estimate that a um, $5 million increase in TPA forest funding should add 67 new foresters and increase our national tribal timber harvest by nearly 300 million board feet. In addition to increasing BI forestry staffing capacity, existing positions need to be filled. As, uh, as my councilman from Yakima testified earlier, at my own tribe, the Yakima Nation, the lack of BI personnel is forcing us, um, has forced us earlier this year to withdraw um, timber sales because they weren't ready. Part of this problem is the BI's hiring practices. Over the past two years, um, I've noted that 33 of the 55 BI forestry positions at Yakima are unfilled, and this continu continues to be unchanged today. The BI's failure to promptly fill open position is directly hindering the tribe's ability to benefit from our forest resources. So in conjunction with um, f funding more forestry personnel, we asked the committee to take a look at the difficulties and delays in the BIA's hiring practices. For BI forestry programs, we urge an increase of $5 million over, $5 million over current amounts to help eliminate the BI's thinning and replanting backlog. These backlogs are long-term drag on our forest productivity. Over in the um, Interior Department of um, Wildland Fire Management, the rehabilitation of 500,000 acres of tribal forest lands that burned in the um, in the catastrophic fires of 2015 is lagging. After the B, after the fires, BI calculated a need of $55 million over five years um, that will be need necessary for the rehabilitation. We are now in our third year, and we have been provided about $18 million, less than half of what is needed to, for that rehabilitation. Tribes have had to divert our own 
limited resources or plead with other others to help pay for the seedlings we need to get growing as soon as possible. Adding to this problem is that after five years, whatever is not accomplished will simply be pushed into our regular and already unfunded forestry management program, adding to our own thinning and replanting backlogs. To prevent this, we ask that the $35 million rehab balance for the 2015 fires be provided directly to the affected tribes. Also, in the Office of Wildland Fire, we urge that the fields, uh, that fields management be restored to its um, fiscal year 2010 level of $206 million, and that the $10 million designated for the tribal projects on non-reservation treaty rights lands be allowed to be spent on tribal lands as well. For the Joint Fire Science Program, we ask that it be maintained at the fiscal year 2017 levels of $5.9 million. With hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on firefighting every year, it makes no sense to eliminate this program that examines fire behavior and gets inf information to the people fighting those fires. Finally, over at the Forest Service, um, please tell them to start implementing the Anchor Force Field Report. The Anchor Force Initiative in Washington State seeks the collaborative collaboration of local stakeholders to preserve the active management and processing capacity needed to sustain ecological and economic stability of their forests. The Forest had was, Service was an active participant in the initiative and f the final report, but has since done nothing. Also, provide direct Forest Service t uh, or direct Forest Service to expand anchor forest initiatives to other regions where tribes um, express interest, including the Lake States, the Plain States, Alaska, and the Southwest. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. On behalf of more than um, 60 <laughs> tribes that make up the Intertribal Timber Council, um, we thank you. That concludes my statement. Thank you, and we appreciate your attendance. Irene, Irene Martin, uh, board member of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. You're the president. Just one. Okay, good morning, Mr. Chairman, uh, ranking member, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Irene Martin, and I'm a member of the Bad River Band of Lake Superior Chippewa. I'm here today on behalf of the National Indian Child Welfare Association. NICWA is a National American Indian um, Alaska Native organization that addresses um, Native um, policy development on children and families. Our mission is twofold. Uh, first, uh, we address issues of child abuse and neglect through policy development, research, and community development. Uh, our second mission is to support the implementation of the Indian Child Welfare Act. Uh, the primary focus of my testimony today are going to be two programs within the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But before I get started, I wanted to take the time to thank the members of this committee and your staff for your support of uh, social services programs that address <coughs> natives. Um, while we feel there can always be more funding, um, we know the situation could be worse and we appreciate your efforts in this regard. So we all know that native children are placed in foster care at a higher rate than the general population, sometimes 10 times higher rate than the general population. But tribal governments have um, some of the most limited access to, to direct funding to address these needs, uh, such as in the case of the social services block grant, uh, Medicaid and the mental health um, care block grant. We know and studies have shown the surest way to reduce the flow of native children into the child welfare system is to ensure that tribes have the full capacity to protect their children and families, whether at home or in care. And although federal law recognizes the tribe's inherent sovereign right to intervene in child welfare proceedings, um, and to provide services for their member, children and families, tri tribal child welfare programs remain seriously underfunded. So we're presenting two recommendations for you today. Uh, the first is with regard to the Indian Child Protection and Family Violence Prevention Act grant programs. Um, this law was uh, passed in 1990 and it has two purposes. One is to identify the scope of incidents of abuse of children and family violence in Indian country and to reduce those incidents and the other is to provide for mental health treatment of children who are victims of abuse and family violence. In the first respect, this law has been very successful. It created mandatory reporting requirements on, uh, in Indian country and required background checks for uh, caregivers and, uh, and teachers and like. In the second respect, it's never been funded. So it had two prongs, one to identify incidents and one to treat children who were victims of, of abuse and neglect. The treatment aspect has never been funded, and so we're recommending that those prog programs do get funded at um, their full authorized amount of $43 million. The second set of programs that I'd like to talk about are um, ICWA programs. And um, with the passage of ICWA, it's been a very successful act. Um, Congress first provided direct funding to tribes to be able to implement child welfare services. 
Um, and while child, tribal, child, sorry, tribal child welfare programs work with some of the most at-risk and needy families in America, they have access to fewer resources than anyone. The current funding level for ICWA programs is just over $18 million. And when you parse that out among all of the tribes that are recognized, um, it comes out to a little over $30,000. But most tribes, it's more than two-thirds, get less than $30,000. With that money, they're expected to provide uh, child protective services, family reunification and rehabilitation services, case management, foster care recruitment and retention, adoption services. And that's not even enough money to full fulfill one full-time FTD on the reservation. Um, we also know that children who live off the reservation um, need these services, but there is no funding for those services. It's been discontinued. Um, yet they're required to have the same services to be able to be reunified with their families. So uh, we are requesting that you fund Indian Child Welfare Services at $30 million for on-reservation and to reinstitute the $5 million for off-reservation ICWA services. <coughs> um, in conclusion, I'd just like to note that statistics tell us that both the Native population and the number of Indian families involved in child welfare services has been increasing over the last several years. So we feel it's imperative to address um, this with increased funding for social service programs. Um, again, I'd like to appreciate, uh, express my appreciation for your efforts to support our programs. And, um, and I'll conclude my remarks here. Good morning. On behalf of the Penobscot Nation, I want to thank the leadership of the subcommittee for continuing to hold these hearings and for continuing to fight against cuts to federal programs that benefit tribal nations. Whenever a president, Democrat or Republican, proposes to cut a program that helps tribes, this subcommittee asks for our views, and that's critical for tribes like Penobscot who rely on federal programs to assist us with providing essential government services for our people and in keeping with the government-to-government -government relationship. Thank you to Ms. Pingree for being a tireless advocate for the tribal nations in Maine. Our relationship with the federal government and state is complicated and different from other tribal nations, and Ms. Pingree has been a huge help in educating Congress about that relationship. My testimony today will focus on the EPA programs we utilize and the opioid crisis that continues to plague our community. The Penobscot Nation has approximately 2,400 citizens and over 123,000 acres of land holdings, of which nearly 91,000 acres are held in trust by the United States. Within our land holdings are about 200 islands located within approximately 80 miles of the Penobscot River. Most of our land is undeveloped forest land, and Indian Island is our largest island and contains our seat of government and is our largest housing community. We are a non-gaming tribe and rely on the federal government to meet its trust responsibility by providing us with federal funds for certain programs that we use to leverage additional grant funding and economic development. We are a natural resource-based tribe. Our people continue to hunt moose, deer, bear, and fish on a regular basis. We are also well known for our basketry, which utilizes traditional plants and trees, and we still use our traditional plants for medicinal purposes. Because of this, management of our lands and other natural resources is integral to our survival. Given the importance of our natural resources to our daily living, we are constantly monitoring for potential contamination of our lands and waters and vigilant about cleaning up any contamination that occurs. Unfortunately, although the Department of the Interior's primary responsibility is to manage natural resources, there is limited funding available for tribal programs at the department. We get minimal funding from the BIA to manage our natural resources and water, and the BIA provides no funding for wildlife or fisheries management. What little money we do get from the Interior Department, we use towards employing game wardens to patrol our 123,000 acres of land. We currently have two game wardens and are in desperate need of a third. Because we receive such little funding from the Interior Department for natural resource and wildlife management, we are forced to apply for competitive grant monies at the Environmental Protection Agency, EPA. A substantial portion of the federal money we receive to manage our natural resources and water comes from the EPA. Thus, any cuts to EPA programmatic funding would likely negatively impact our nation. Because this funding is unreliable, because it is competitive and only lasts one to two fiscal years, we just lost an excellent wildlife biologist because we do not have secure funding that covers multiple funding years. For these reasons, we would encourage the subcommittee to consider including set-asides within the EPA budget for tribal governments or direct the EPA to offer more multi-year grants for tribal governments. The main point I want to convey is that we cannot manage our natural resources and continue our sustenance way of life without EPA programs. 
We know that the president has proposed cuts to EPA funding for fiscal year 2019, but we ask that you consider the tribal nations when you make funding decisions for these programs. The last thing I wanna talk about is our continuing efforts to combat the opioid crisis in our community. Cancer and opioid abuse are the leading causes of death amongst the Penobscot people. While the entire New England region and state of Maine is facing this epidemic, this problem is exacerbated within our small tribal community where we have lived for hundreds of years. Like other tribal communities, we are trying to mitigate the impacts of intergenerational trauma, much of which was caused by failed past federal policies. We have made progress on this front over the past 20 years, but the current opioid and drug crisis is threatening to undo that progress. Two statistics have us deeply concerned. Almost 80% of our child welfare cases within the past four years involve parental opioid abuse, and about 160 plus households that were served by our social services programs in 2017, 42 are perceived by staff to have one or both parents with a substance abuse problem. We know the subcommittee fought hard to make sure that the Interior Department got an increase in funding for fiscal year 2018 to help address the opioid crisis in tribal communities. Thank you for that effort, it did not go unnoticed. The Penobscot Nation makes three funding recommendations to continue combating this epidemic. First, ensure that the Bureau of Indian Affairs, BIA, puts drug investigators on the ground in tribal communities. This subcommittee directed some of the increased funding for FY18 to be used for more drug investigators. Second, increase funding for tribal courts that focus on drug crimes. Tribal courts are essential to our efforts to combat the opioid crisis. However, the FY 2018 Omnibus Appropriations Bill failed to provide any increase in funding for these courts. We urge the subcommittee to provide an increase in funding to those tribal courts that focus on drug crimes. And finally, allow the BIA to provide tribal law enforcement with Narcan. In FY 2018 20 in 2017, our tribal health facility experienced difficulty in obtaining access to Narcan. This was due to jurisdictional complexities between the tribe and state resulting from the Maine Indian Claim Settlement Act. When our tribal law enforcement reached out to BIA's Office of Justice Services for Assistance, we were informed that they could not provide tribal law enforcement with Narcan. Given the high rates of opioid abuse in Indian Country, we ask that the committee work with BIA to find a way to provide Narcan to tribal law enforcement entities. That's my testimony. I thank you for your time today and for considering our requests. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, for your testimony. Uh, Ms. Pingree, did you have any questions you wanted to ask? Uh, yeah. You're right here. Oops. Caught me off guard there, Mr. Chair. Um, <laughs> what that? That's what I do. <laughs> yeah, well, you did it well. Woke me up. Uh, no, but thank you very much to all of you for your testimony, and uh, Maline, thank you very much for being here, and your kind words. I, I feel very grateful that I have the opportunity to work with the Maine tribes, and um, know that we could do a lot more here, and know that you are, you experience a particularly challenging situation because of our land claim settlement. Um, let me just quickly mention uh, two things. Uh, you brought up the EPA funding, and I'm sure you know that uh, this committee also has jurisdiction over that funding, so I appreciate your reminding the committee. Um, and I think you gave us a pretty good understanding of, of how that funding is used, but if you wanna just say anything else about the, the, the uses that you're able to put it to, but I, I think you were explicit about that. Um, and then um, just on the opioid crisis, which uh, as you know, everyone faces, um, but w have there been any best practices that you've come about? And um, besides the Narcan thing, which I appreciate you bringing that to our attention, perhaps we can find a way to help through the committee, but um, any other ways that the, uh, you know, the unique relationship that we have with the Indian Land Claim Settlement has affected the ability of a tribe to work with those issues. Certainly, we've had great success with a healing to wellness court program, mm -hmm. which uh, is a holistic approach. Uh, um, it starts with people actually, you know, getting arrested and getting into the system, and then they're able to enter this wellness court, which is a mixture of nine different tribal uh, departments. So the issue is, since we're kind of piecemealing it together from these departments, we are not um, able to use funding directly allocated for our tribal court. So, um, you know, we have this public law 280 for other um, states with, with this situation, the tribes, and I think uh, if the committee would think about thinking about tribes with land claim settlements that are in similar situations. And also we have jurisdictional issues where we have convictions happening and we can't figure out who has the ball between the state and the BIA and the tribe. So we end up really having dangerous criminals not facing persecution because nobody can figure out how to persecute them. Mm -hmm. And um, that's obviously a serious issue. Is it 
would you say that's more of a difficulty with working with the state or at our level or just kind of finding some coordination between the two? We need to find some coordination between the two, and I think that comes from um, fully funding that tribal court and making sure it has the resources. Great. Well, I, I really appreciate your testimony today and, and hope that I can work with the committee on some of these things that maybe we can solve without fixing every problem in the budget, which is hard to tackle. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Bella, you have a question? Uh, thank you. If uh, Ms. Martin, uh, every, every state's different, every tribal nation's different. So we all face the same challenges and, and let me say opportunities to address those challenges. Uh, one of the um, things that you mentioned in your testimony was the unequal funding for children who find them, Native American children find themselves in urban settings. Um, it's the case uh, in Minnesota quite often that these children are going back and forth. Uh, sometimes when they're stressed in a family on the reservation, um, they come uh, to be with a family member uh, in, in, in the Twin Cities area most often. And um, your testimony would clearly indicate to me that that funding, that support is not following the child. Should not the money be associated with the child and not necessarily where the child is? Would that be a difference? Is that something that would make any sense or does it just uh, complicate things more because we're already, we have inadequacies in the program and, and um, making sure that money follows children and is used appropriately also means more employees to track that. We don't wanna necessarily fund more employees. We wanna get more help for children. What would be some of the solutions maybe that you would look at and or would it be different in, in each state with each tribal organization. Can you enlighten us just a little more and then I'll continue the conversation in our office later. Thank you. Sure. Um, you know, I think in an ideal world, we'd be able to have uh, a system that where the funding and the services would follow the child. But I think given the complexities of Indian country and interjurisdictional issues, that would be very difficult, if not impossible to kind of implement. Um, and so w one of the things that, that, that I talked about earlier was having this urban program be funded. And, and I think uh, it, it's similar but not the same as the urban Indian health program, right? Where uh, you have these urban populations and the kids are going back and forth. When they go to the urban area, the, the services are just kind of lost and they go into the, the general system. And then if the tribe is able and has um, the, the ability to track that child, then, then they can try to keep track of that. But if they don't, then, then they can't. Um, and so the idea would be then to provide funding to these urban organizations that would be able to track them and kind of create that point back and forth that, that they would be able to do that with. Um, I, I, as for pilot programs, I think we have a lot of good ideas. Um, be happy to follow up with your office. Um, th I've been involved in um, a very good program at Oneida in Wisconsin where they've been able to sex successfully bridge that gap between the urban population, um, populations outside of their state, uh, but it's taken a lot of their own resources and time and effort to make that work. Um, but, I'd, but I'd love to follow up with you about that. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I, I think that um, we're hearing more and more from um, tribal urban populations which don't lose their, their treaty rights uh, just because of where they've moved in the state for employment um, at, at times and to, to support the, those families that are trying to keep family reunification, trying to keep the foster system from continuing to be over, um, over rep I should say underrepresented with um, Native American children being culturally appropriately placed at a time of great stress when they really need the support of their entire community, uh, community and culture is really, really important. And that grandparent, quite often it's a grandparent from my interactions in the Twin Cities, they could use the support. Um, so uh, Mr. Chair, I look forward to continuing the conversation and maybe having our staffs work to see if there's some equitable solutions to make sure children are given every opportunity to heal. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Thank you for your testimony. I, uh, one thing, one question on, on the uh, on timber, the the U.S. Forest Service. Uh, are, are you seeing a slowdown in hiring out there in the uh, in the country, as far as you can see, as, as far as number of people are out there on the ground? Uh, 
uh, as for within the tr uh, the thing that we're witnessing is the inability of the federal government to fill positions. Uh, is that just recently, or is that? Uh, I, I think that's been going on for, for quite at while. least the last the last decade, uh, and, and for quite a while. Okay, thank you very much. Appreciate uh, your coming here. Have a great day. You. This is our last panel for this morning. Uh, we're going to start off with uh, Kirk Francis, who's the president of the United South Eastern Tribe Sovereignty Protection Fund, and uh, you're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, sir. Um, good morning, and uh, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, uh, Representative Pingree, it's good to see you again, and members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today and for your consistent commitment to hold a Native American public witness hearings. My name, as you mentioned, is Kirk Francis. I serve as president of the United South and Eastern Tribes Sovereignty Protection Fund. I am also chief of the Penobscot Indian Nation located at Indian Island, Maine. As was acknowledged by the 100th Congress, the United States owes a historical debt to tribal nations. This debt includes the many injustices that Native peoples have suffered as a result of federal policy including federal actions that sought to terminate tribal nations and assimilate native people. Federal appropriations to Indian country are simply a repayment of this debt. This is not merely a question about addressing poverty and needs. Our relationship is more than this. This is ultimately a question about honor, about fulfilling commitments and promises. A great nation does keep its word. We are being told that the request is just a messaging document and that if Indian country does not agree with its proposals, we should look to Congress to ensure the trust responsibility is delivered upon. While we understand that only Congress has the power to appropriate funds, the administration is sending a powerfully negative message to Indian country in reducing, eliminating, and calling into question the constitutionality of federal Indian programs. This administration is ignoring and undermining its trust responsibility to tribal nations, and this is simply unacceptable. Because of our history and unique relationship with the United States, the trust obligation of the federal government to Native peoples as reflected in the federal budget is fundamentally different from ordinary discretionary spending and should be considered mandatory in nature. Recently, some in Congress have called for the mandatory funding of the IHS. We strongly support this proposal, which is more consistent with the federal trust obligation, and urge that this be expanded to include all federal Indian programs. Continued underfunding results in tribal nations have to su having to subsidize greater and greater levels of this obligation, a violent administration. We urge this subcommittee and all congressional appropriators, as you previously have, to reject these deep cuts found in the President's request and work fully to fund this uh, trust obligation. Now I'd like to turn to some of the specific comments we have on the President's budget. Regarding proposals for an infrastructure package, it is critical that allocates funding from the BIA budget for the reorganization of the Department of Interior. The Secretary has yet to significantly consult with or provide much detail to tribal nations on the reorganization of the department. Although we are aware of meetings being held with federal employees and other units of government, as well as some draft regional plans, the request for Indian Affairs is a 15.6% decrease from the FY 2018 CR and a 20% decrease from the omnibus. Nearly every line item in the BIA budget would see reductions. 
However, Interior's budget justification describes the request in the following way. The 2019 budget supports the administration's commitment to help promote tribal nation building and self-determination, empower tribal communities, foster tribal self-sufficiency, create educational and economic opportunities, ensure safe Indian communities, preserve and foster cultural heritage, and steward natural resources. From our perspective, it's difficult to see how any of this can be true, considering these deep uh, reductions and eliminations found in this request. The FY 2019 budget request for IHS is 8% above the FY 2018 CR, but a slight decrease from the omnibus. We strongly support increases to this chronically underfunded agency. Despite these increases, we and others in Indian Country are strongly opposed to the elimination of the Community Health Representative Program, as well as other eliminations and decreases found in the request. Finally, the request also proposes to move the Special Diabetes Program for Indians from mandatory to discretionary funding. From our perspective, this proposal represents the exact opposite of what we're trying to achieve, which is mandatory funding for all I federal Indian programs. In closing, while we take a firm position that all members of Congress have an obligation to tribal nations, the members of this subcommittee have a greater role in understanding and working toward fulfillment of that obligation. As leaders who have consistently demonstrated a true understanding of this commitment, we implore this subcommittee to lead the change within Congress that is necessary to improve how the United States views, honors, and fulfills its promises to Indian Country. The federal budget is a reflection of this commitment. We recognize that there are many causes and issues that this body considers. However, we ask that you always remember and fight and seek to deliver upon this nation's first promise to its first peoples and its trust obligation. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Brandon Yellowbird Stevens, Vice Chairman of the Oneida Indian Nation. Welcome. Uh, good morning, uh, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and members of the committee. Um, I'm Brandon Stevens, Vice Chairman of the Oneida Nation, and thank you for the opportunity to represent over 17,000 Oneidas. Uh, I'd also like to thank the committee for its commitment to Indian Country which we saw demonstrated by the much needed increases in federal funding for the many tribal programs in the Omnibus Bill earlier this year. In my testimony today, I will identify three priorities to the committee which impact not just the United Nation, but other tribes and communities. Self-governance funding, the opiate ec epidemic, and the Great Lakes Restoration Initiative. We were pleased to host Interior Secretary Ryan Zinke this past March when he joined our business committee for a discussion of these topics. We look forward to working with the Secretary and the Committee to strengthen and improve tribal programs in the coming years. Uh, the self-governance portion, the Oneida Nation has assumed increasing levels of responsibility for nearly 25 years. We have been a self-governance partner with the Department of Interior. We now administer nearly 40 programs, ranging from social services and law enforcement to job training and scholarships. Self-governance not only ensures that scarce federal resources are used as efficiently as possible, but it also helps to build the capacity within tribal governments to address many of their members' needs. However, of the 4.5 million that we at Oneida direct to self-governance activities, only 1.2 million is federally funded. That is why we find it particularly concerning that the President's budget proposes a reduction in self-governance funds, which would harm the progress we have made and prevent other tribes from beginning their own self-governance programs. We encourage you to support the additional self-governance agreements between tribes and both BIA and non-BIA agencies. The Self-Determination and El Education Assistance Act provided the tribes the opportunity to enter into agreements with non-BIA agencies, but some interior agencies and offices have made those agreements difficult to negotiate. We ask that you encourage non-BIA agencies to enter into self-governance agreements with tribes and direct additional resources towards the Office of Self-Governance. The nation recently encountered a situation where a tribal member was in an abusive relationship and abusing opiates, which resulted in her being unable to care for her children. The Indian Child Welfare Department stepped in and provided intensive support in facilitating wraparound services, including counseling, substance abuse assistance, transportation to and from appointments, and cultural ceremonies to aid in her recovery. The combination of traditional practices with clinical treatment proved to be very successful, and within six months she was again able to care for her child. 
It is this close alignment of the tribal government and community programs that has allowed us to provide overlapping, coordinated services that led to positive outcomes like this. The United Nations thanks this committee for its consistent support of tribal sovereignty and its determination to ensure that tribes and Congress continue to have a government-to-government -government relationship. This leads me to our next topic, increased, increased federal support in opiate issues in Indian country. Sadly, Indian country has not been immune to the opiate abuse epidemic sweeping the nation. I've just identified one instance in which opiates negatively impact an Oneida family, but this crisis is impacting tribes across the nation. Oneida Nation conducted an assessment within our community and launched the Tribal Action Plan to address opiates and other substance abuse. We've worked to develop a strategy that doesn't focus solely on law enforcement, but provides supportive services and treatment to help our members regain control of their lives. <coughs> Excuse me. While law enforcement is certainly part of the formula for success against opiate, at Oneida we believe that mental health treatment and addiction support must be part of the equation. We hope as you consider funding for the coming years, you will recognize that those impacted by opiates need federal resources to help break the cycle of addiction and include mental health and addiction support and diversion program eligibility. We are pleased to see that an omnibus bill that included significant funding directly specifically to Indian tribes for opiate treatment. However, we remain concerned that Interior and other agencies will focus on competitive grants. We would uh, instead urge that Interior award base funding increases, allowing tribes to build internal capacities and comprehensive programs to meet the need of these challenges over the long term. And lastly, the Great Lakes Re Restoration Initiative. In short, the Great, La Great Lakes Restoration Initiative has been the single most successful federal program designed to help restore lands, yet these improvements benefit not just Oneida, but the entire region. Given the enormous successes of the program at Oneida and across the Midwest, it is deeply concerning that the President's budget proposes to reduce federal funding for the program by 90%. A funding cut of this magnitude would not only hurt our fishing, tourism, and agriculture industries, but would jeopardize hundreds of millions of dollars in investments from state and local governments, as well as the private sector. Oneida Nation of Wisconsin strongly urges the committee to reject the proposal cuts to this program and continue funding it at the level approved in this omnibus bill. Thank you once again for the opportunity to join you today and showcase just a fraction of the ability of tribes to manage their own programs while recognizing tribal sovereignty. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, William Harris, uh, Chief of the uh, Catalpa Indian Nation. Opposed? Pass. Pass. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good. Let's go with Catawba Nation. <laughs> so. Thank you, Chairman Calvert, Ranking Member McCollum, and Subcommittee Member Pinkman. I appreciate the opportunity to testify for on critical funding needs for American Indian and Alaska Native programs. My name is William Harris. I am the Chief of the Catawba Indian Nation, the only federally recognized tribe in the state of South Carolina. My written testimony sets forth specific funding recommendations. I will just touch on a major theme, some, some major themes here. Let me begin by saying that this subcommittee's hard work is paying off, and we encourage you to continue your fight to address the great needs in Indian country. Just as the Catawba people stood side by side with the American patriots during the revolution, this subcommittee has stood side by side with Native peoples today. And just as the Constitution acknowledges tribal governments, so too does it provide for the work of this subcommittee in fulfillment of trust responsibilities to tribal nations and tribal peoples. I'm here to speak on behalf of many tribes, mostly smaller or more remote, who have limited economic development opportunities, and in our case, no gaming enterprise. Many tribes are economic engines in such areas as tourism, energy, small business development, commercial services. However, limited access to capital investment financing remains substantial barriers to economic development in Indian country. We struggle with uniquely burdensome federal restrictions and regulations poor infrastructure, and other challenges that limit our, economy, our, limit our economy from flourishing. It is important to create avenues of investment, funding resources, and business models that are mutually advantageous to, to tribes and potential partners for economic advancement, stability, and diversification. We encourage the subcommittee to provide increased support for investment opportunities in Indian country. The Catawba Indian Nation depends on IHS for the delivery of health services. Access is limited, however, <coughs> due to local service 
units <coughs> restricted operating hours and lack of emergency and urgent care services. For its part, the Catawba Nation is planting the seeds for healthy generations of tribal members through our Wellness Warrior Program. The mission of the Wellness Warriors is to improve overall community health through cross-cutting programs, health education, physical activity, nutrition, and tobacco cessation. We know that you already recognize the importance of the Indian Health Service and urge you to continue to work towards full funding of IHS in the fiscal year 2019 budget and continue to support preventive health services and programs. We are working with the Department of Justice and the Bureau of Indian Affairs in the creation of a healing to wellness alternative drug court, law enforcement agency, and related justice services. Please fund Indian country public safety across the board. Since before recorded history, the Catawbas have, have lived in the Piedmont area, what is now called North and South Carolina, along the life-giving waters of the river bearing our name. We seek to protect, protect this river and indeed all of our surrounding environments, working in concert with the federal and state governments. For example, we partner with the state to generate air quality forecasts for a three county area. <coughs> and we establish a water monitoring program using Clean Water, Clean water Act funding. We urge Congress to maintain adequate funding for EPA environmental programs serving Indian country. In recent years, an increasing number of tribal governments have established tribal historic preservation offices equivalent to state programs under the National Historic Preservation Act. This is the front line for protecting our cultural heritage. Although funding was increased for TIPOs in fiscal year 2018, we urge Congress to hold the course and provide an increase in TIPO funding for the fiscal year 2019. We also urge you to maintain expanded funding for NAGPRA-related law enforcement activities. With a secure and dedicated funding stream, BIA and tribal officials will have an enhanced capacity to combat and deter illegal trafficking in tribal cultural patrimony. I thank you for the consideration of my testimony. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Joseph P. Crowell. He might have made me feel a little more comfortable, but uh, <laughs> I have to say I'm impressed and jealous with the technology use. That's pretty good. Yeah, there you go. Well, good morning, Chairman Calvert and Ranking Thank Member you. McCollum and Subcommittee Pinker. Um, I am Joe Crawley. I'm President of the American Dental Association. I'm a practicing dentist in Cincinnati, Ohio. Um, on behalf of the American Dental Association, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify on the oral health issues that affect the American Indians and the Alaska Natives and the dentists who serve uh, this group through the IHS programs and the tribal programs. For fiscal year 2019, the ADA requests $199 million for the IHS Division of Oral Health. We thank the committee for the strong commitment you have made to improve the oral health care of the Native Americans. Your support for many years has resulted in improvement, especially amongst their children. You're strong backers of the dental program's Early Childhood Carries Initiative, which aimed to reduce tooth decay among children under the age of five. Through this program, the IHS has been able to significantly increase prevention and early intervention with these children. However, more is needed to overcome the disparity of oral disease in the tribal communities. Over 80 percent of the American Indian and Alaska Native children ages 6 to 9 and 13 to 15 suffer from dental decay, which is while less than 50 percent of the U.S. population in that same age is affected. Also. American Indians and, and Alaska Native adults have more than double the prevalence of untreated tooth decay as the general U.S. population. One of the most important accounts in the administration's fiscal year 19 IHS dental program budget is for clinical services. This funding is used to provide direct dental services including emergency prevention and complex restorative care. The administration is proposing an increase of only $1.7 million, which we believe is an unrealistic request. In 2017, the IHS dental program provided over 3 million basic dental services in 440, 404 dental programs in 35 states. The administration's current request would be less than $1 per visit. The ADA recommends that the IHS dental clinic services line be increased by at least $3 million. The ADA applauds the IHS for its excellent dentist recruitment program that begins focusing on dental students. Each year, the IHS offers an externship program to third-year dental students. In 2016, 115 students were placed in 23 different sites. 
despite the success of the extern program and other recruitment efforts, the dental vacancy rate in IHS hovers above 20 percent. While dental students' debt averages more than $250,000 when they leave school, the loan repayment program has proven to be an effective mechanism for recruitment and retention. There are more health care providers who are willing to serve in the IHS than there is loan repayment money. In 2017 alone, 788 providers, including 18 dentists, were turned down for loan repayment. The service estimates that it would take an additional $39 million to meet these requests. We strongly encourage the committee to fully fund this program to ensure all interested health care providers can serve the IHS. The ADA is pleased that the IHS is making progress on the centralized credentialing system, and we thank the committee for supporting this effort. It's our understanding that credentialing software has been implemented across all HS uh, direct service areas. This will streamline credentialing process and can help fill the dental vacancies with quality health care professionals. Expansive but s secure credentialing will also allow private dentists to provide care in a timely manner for the IHS. Additionally, the ADA strongly opposes the, administ the administration's proposal to eliminate the Community Health Representatives, or the CHR. We are currently working with the Navajo CHR Outreach Program to produce a guide for adding oral health components to their work. Educating Navajo CHRs and dental assistants to become community dental health coordinators will enable greater community outreach to community oral health education prevention services. Most CDHCs have grown up, grown up in the communities they serve, allowing through cult cultural competence to better understand the problems of limited access to dental care. The ADA has invested $7 million of our money in the development and expansion of the CDH HOPE program. There are currently 16 CDHCs and tribal facilities in the Chickasaw and the Navajo Nation communities in Oklahoma and Arizona. Their successes have been uh, just unbelievable what they're doing. I thank you for the opportunity to, um, for the ADA to testify. We're committed to working with you, the IHS, and our tribal nations to aggressively reduce the level of oral disease in the Indian country. Thank you. Thank you, and uh, thank you for your testimony. Uh, Ms. McClellan. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Mr. Chair. It is um, wonderful to have you here, Ms. Mr. Kelly. I mean, I've, I have questions for everyone, but to have uh, you in the room when we're talking about health care, because lots of times when people talk about health care, you don't think about your eyes, ears, mm -hmm. your teeth, right, or your mental health. And if you don't have good oral health, having good physical health becomes a real challenge. So I'm so pleased um, that, that you're here. Um, you touched on a couple of things that uh, this committee and a working group working with uh, bipartisanly, I'm going to say nonpartisanly, um, with uh, some of our, our, our folks from the authorizers committee has focused pretty much on um, physical health, but there's also been some uh, discussions about oral health. So. Um, any more that you can give us in supporting documentation would be um, help, helpful um, in um, moving forward and making sure that oral health is fully funded. But I want to touch on the fact that you talked about um, the loan repayment um, that, that you had 18 dentists were turned down for uh, loan repayment. Uh, IHS uh, reports that 700 and 788 health care providers were turned down for loan repayment. That's huge, uh, especially with what we're trying to do in Indian country. But one of the other things that we're hearing from our, um, our tribal nations is, um, is how do we, if we recruit someone, we, retrain, we retain them. So we're turning a lot of people away, but if there's things that we should be aware of in retaining those dentists and those health care professionals, that would be appreciated if you'd share that with uh, me. You also touched on medical records in your full testimony and the linking between um, the, uh, the dental medical record as well as the health medical record in providing holistic approach um, is, is important. So anything more that you would like to share with us on that as we, as we move forward to try to um, um, increase uh, the, the amount of financial support you're getting. And then something that I found was very troubling, um, uh, and I'm going to ask the staff maybe to look at this more, on page three of your testimony was a, uh, something that happened with the South Dakota Dental Association where they were trying to come up with a pilot program, especially with pediatric dentistry, um, where 
uh, focuses on early um, intervention and how there was whether the red tape was on the South Dakota side, the federal side, whatever it was, this should have been a get up and running program that could have been held up around the, uh, around the country and instead it didn't turn out so good. Um, and it wasn't due to lack of um, people from your profession wanting to volunteer. So I would like to learn more about how we can work with, uh, with you um, on that. Um, my only other comment would be to um, Mr. Stevens from the great state to the east of us, Wisconsin, <laughs> uh, east of, uh, of Minnesota, and that is um, I know that you said that um, Mr. Zinke had been out to meet with you, Secretary Zinke had yes. been out to meet with you. I know that um, the Oneida Nation as well as many of the Anishinaabe nations in Minnesota are struggling with um, making sure that there's full tribal consultation when it comes to sulfite ore mining. I'm wondering, do you, do you know if that came up with the, with, the, with the Secretary at all? I know that's something you've been struggling with at a state level. Some of my tribes are struggling, not as much, I don't think, as Wisconsin tribes, but a little bit to make sure that they're at the table. But our tribes are really trying to make sure that they're at the table on some of these um, federal mining leases and that there's full tribal consultation. Can you maybe enlighten me what's going on in Wisconsin or put me in contact with someone? Thank you. Yeah, it's pretty much the same thing, you know, uh, we're being treated as a, as a local, you know, I guess, individual. And so we want the, the prior consent, we want the, the consultation, we want someone there with some discretion. I guess that's, that's it, it, it's f failing with the sulfur mining and we're not asking for, dealing with the, the watersheds, we don't get a lot of that because some of that it comes down by the lower tribes and so we don't get the notifications and they, they go out and they're not, it's always inconsistent. And so we would always like stronger consultation across the board, you know, at least uh, a framework of how it's done agency to agency. And we don't, we don't, we're not seeing that in Wisconsin with the, with the mines. Okay, well, I'd like to work with um, MAST on that uh, and the Wisconsin and Minnesota tribes in particular because it can affect uh, fish uh, treaty rights as well as uh, just uh, the quality and the protection of wild rice. Thank you, Mr. Chair. May I then, was I to answer some questions or you just like, okay. you loaded so up I a lot. I gave you so much homework. <laughs> I, you loaded I'm so up a excited lot. you're here. And, and for your deliberation, if I may just quickly, number one, I think you have expressly cited the fact that oral health and total health now are so connected and where we can do that. And with our CDHC programs on the tribal lands, helping people prevent disease instead of just treat disease is critical. The loan repayment, I'd like to just answer something quickly there. And it's about the millennials. We understand, you know, millennials, our dental students don't even like to be called millennials except that. We know millennials have a social conscience that far exceeds anything that we have had in previous generations. You couple that with loan repayment and maybe moving them into to help the tribal lands for a five-year period, that becomes a consistent place. And we also know that these young people will, with the loan repayment, go into communities and want to stay. So I think your answer to longevity, I think, can be looked at. I know it's money, but the loan repayment program has some tremendous successes. So I appreciate your recognition of that, and certainly we'll provide you with any information you need um, moving forward. Ms. Bingo. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you to everybody for being with us today in your testimony. And um, Chief Francis, appreciate seeing you in your other role. Um, and just a couple questions around that from your USET perspective. Um, everyone today has been bringing up the opioid crisis, and uh, we heard a little bit about how <coughs> how things are working in the Penobscot Nation and some of the unique programs that are going on there. But when you're looking at it from the USET perspective, can you tell us a little bit more about how um, you're working on that sort of across the board. Um, and let me just throw up my second question. Uh, I think this issue around the Department of Interior reorganization um, is still somewhat confusing to many of us because it's not completely clear, although we have had at least one presentation about it. But you mentioned your concerns about how that would affect the multiple tribes that would be within the USET region. And uh, so can you help me to better understand that as I'm looking at the overall proposal? Sure, thank you, and it's good to see you as well. The, um, 
In terms of the opioid, it, this is probably going to be a reoccurring theme for the committee over the next few days. It's um, it's a highly concerning issue and and something that within the member tribes of USET is at the top of our priority list. Um, we have an opioid task force, and we um, so when we say things like the 150 million doesn't really scratch the surface, it's not that we're not appreciative of those efforts, and we um, but this is a problem in a magnitude I don't think that we've really seen in a long time and we honestly believe the more effectiveness we have when you see billions of dollars off the reservation um, the more effectiveness we have off the reservation and the, m and the lack of effectiveness on the reservation is just gonna uh, grow the problem within Indian country because it'll create havens you know a lot of tribes are on international borders there's just a lot of opportunity for that to grow within tribal communities. So um, what we really are saying is there's no real cookie cutter approach. Uh, you heard Ambassador uh, Dana earlier talk about healing to wellness, for example, and the ability to collaborate with departments. Also in Maine, we have a unique opportunity through um, working with Maine Drug Enforcement Agents. Um, so we can, pr our problem is having the resources to provide an agent, simply one agent to an officer to MDEA to get focus on the reservations. You know, we have seven BIA law enforcement, drug enforcement officers for an entire region. Um, so we just need to get more effective without those types of investigative efforts and enforcement and, and um, parity and funding. It's hard to get people in those good programs you have. So um, so I would just say that on that. And um, in, in terms of the, uh, the reorganization, you know, when we see um, $900,000 for pre-planning for this. Um, we um, are hearing they're going to break the eastern region, for example, up into four regions. Um, we think that is um, going to lead to highly ineffective service delivery when you're talking about an agency in the Department of Interior that has so many disciplines in it. And the one that predominantly really deals with humans is the Bureau of Indian Affairs. and. Um, so rotating leadership, for example, through four regions dealing with uh, native issues is just going to be a perpetual education process and, um, again, lead to a lot of ineffectiveness in service delivery. And there are examples that can be modeled. You know, if you look at HHS, for example, um, we're serviced by four regions under HHS, but one IHS. So these... Um, these regional directors are extremely important from a subject matter expertise standpoint. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Chief Harris, you mentioned uh, capital investment uh, financing, and that's something that we're going to be looking into in FY19. So just wanted you to know that. Glad to hear that. Yeah. And, uh, and I want to have everybody rest assured, we'll, uh, this committee will keep our treaty obligations. And so uh, we, I know we get recommendations from folks down down the street, but uh, <laughs> we'll work together and uh, work this out, and I'm sure we'll have a positive outcome. With that, I appreciate you all coming here today, and uh, we're adjourned for this morning.